welcome to the uh, planning and zoning meeting for Smiler's Wharf. I'm David Rathbun, I'm the chairman, and seated tonight on our commission is Sean Mastrani, Ben Philbrook, uh, Curtis Lynch, and Gardner Young. Alternates here are Peter Shemowitz, Lynn Conway, and Fred Dykeman. Uh, a few, few items before we begin. Uh, the exits are back there and to the front of the auditorium. The, I like to keep this meeting in a fairly orderly fashion. So if you please link, and I start having any applause because that tends to take up time and it's, it's gonna be a long meeting and I understand that we wanna be able to hear everything. Uh, way this will begin, the applicant, if you haven't been to a planning and zoning session before, the applicant will give his presentation. And then, after he has finished his presentation, the, all those who support the application are asked to speak. And due to the crowd, I'd like to, if possible, people could kind of limit their time to about two minutes. There's podiums on both sides. I'll be calling up 10 names at a time so we can try to move things along. If someone has said what, you, what you'd like to say, just please say you agree with it. And if you do need a just time to speak after everyone has spoken, um, you'll have additional three minutes. And after that, we'll ask the opposition, those anyone opposed to this application to speak, and they will have the same times <coughs> as those who are in favor of the application. And then at the end, we'll have general comments uh, on the application. And then after that, the applicant has a right for a rebuttal. And then the final thing we'll have is a staff report or staff comments. Uh, due to the fact that I don't think we're going to get through everything tonight, the meeting will end at 11 and it will be continued to July 8th, right here in the auditorium. Sometimes we stay to one or two o'clock in the morning, we don't wanna do that tonight. So 11 o'clock is the cutoff for tonight. Yeah. Uh, any, oh, and one other thing, just a housekeeping. <clears throat> Someone put my email on Facebook today and I, I it's ex parte for me to receive personal emails, any correspondence, or any zoning application. So if you want to contact me or any member of the board, please do it through the planning office. Um, I did that. Uh, Sean? Pursuant to the general statutes of the state of Connecticut, Okay. No. Hey, we forgot to do the slide. We don't do that oh. Pursuant to the general statutes of the State of Connecticut, revision of 1958, and all amendments thereto, and pursuant to the zoning regulations for the Town of Stonington, Connecticut, the Planning and Zoning Commission hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing at the Stonington High School, 176 South Broad Street, Pawcatuck, Connecticut, on Monday, June 17, 2019, at 7 p.m. on the following application. PZ1908ZC, No Inc. Shipyard, Inc. Zone change map amendment master plan for rezoning a portion of the Seaport Marine site from a Marine Commercial District, MC80, to a Neighborhood Development District, NDD, for a mixed use waterfront development. Properties located at 2, 4, 10, and 18 Washington Street and Willow Street, Mystic Assessors Map 182, Block 1, Lot 16, 12, 8, 7, and 6. Zone MC80 and RC120. I got it. Mr. Sweeney? Good evening, can you hear me okay? We've got a couple of microphones here, so I'll try to speak into the one that actually matters. Uh, 
My name is Bill Sweeney. I am a partner and a land use attorney with the law firm of Tobin Carberry in New London, Connecticut. And as always, it's a pleasure to appear before you tonight. I represent No Inc. Shipyard Incorporated, which has submitted a zone change master plan application for its existing seaport marine facility located at Washington and Willow Streets in Mystic, Connecticut. As many of you are aware, my client is a family-owned business, owned and operated, that runs not only Seaport Marine, but also the No Inc. Shipyard just downriver. Joining me tonight, I think in the back, uh, is John Holstein, who is the principal owner of No Inc. Shipyard Incorporated, as well as his family. As many of you know, John's a longtime resident of Stonington. He's lived here since 1974. He's also a distinguished member of the business community who's volunteered with numerous community and nonprofit boards and agencies. Also joining me tonight are his daughter, Abby, and his son-in-law, Harry Bordson, also both Stonington residents who represent the second generation of this family business. Tonight, we'll be presenting to you not just a zoning application, but a reimagined vision for the Seaport Marine site that will redevelop it from the tired and underutilized industrial boatyard that it is today to a vibrant, mixed-use waterfront neighborhood that will provide a special place for residents and visitors alike to live, work, and play at the mouth of the Mystic River. This new mixed-use development would be called Smiler's Wharf. This vision has taken a number of years to evolve and refine, and it's important to understand that it's being driven by economic realities. Despite the addition of the successful Red 36 restaurant to the boat yard several years ago, many of the heavier industrial boat yard uses on site are not economically viable to be maintained long term at this location. While the marina itself is still very successful, the boat repair, storage, and haul-out operations at Seaport Marine, which run out of a collection of aging warehouses long past their useful life, must be consolidated to the south at Seaport Marine's sister boatyard in No Inc. if they are to remain viable. This planned relocation of those certain boatyard uses is necessary to preserve them, but also has created an incredible opportunity to remake the peninsula once known as Pistol Point into a thriving waterfront development with substantial public access that does not exist today. Over the last two years, our design team has spent hundreds of hours carefully crafting a proposal that takes advantage of the site's unique location and characteristics, but also planning a redevelopment that is sensitive to adjacent natural resources and which will fit into the character and the fabric of the greater mystic area. The plan we are going to present to you tonight has gone through multiple iterations, literally two dozen, and is substantially less intensive than the preliminary concepts we shared with you at our informal workshop with this commission last year. Contrary to the suggestion of some, this is a modest proposal for a relatively large property with a housing density far below the lowest tiered allowed by your regulations and new buildings on the site covering less than what is actually occupied today by the warehouses. I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce our extraordinary design team, many of whom you'll hear from tonight during our presentation. Meg Lyons is our lead designer and project architect, and she's joined tonight by her associate Brian Shook, as well as Chris Thorpe, who's our landscape architect. Jane Stahl, formerly the deputy commissioner of Connecticut DEP, is our coastal and water dependency consultant. Ron Nault and Ron Degon are our civil engineers and our principals with Lux Engineering. Rich Snarsky is our wetland scientist with New England Environmental Services. And Todd Brayton is our traffic engineer with Bryan Associates. Finally, Don Poland from Gorman and York Property Advisors is our fiscal impact expert. This team has been dedicated to designing a master plan for this site that is responsible, conservative, and will ultimately lead to a development that will be an asset for the community. In addition, in addition to the workshop we held with you last year, over the last few months we've presented this plan to multiple town boards and commissions in full public participation sessions with little to no opposition. We subsequently received unanimous support from the pro for the project from the Architectural Design Review Board, the Police Commission, the Conservation Commission, the Harbor Management Commission, and most recently, the Economic Development Commission. Over the last year, we've also made repeated attempts to reach out to citizens of this community. 
We've received tremendous support from many neighbors, residents and businesses alike, both in and outside of Stonington. At this time, I'd like to submit approximately 200 letters of support that we've garnered for this project into the record. Others have expressed some concerns about the project, many of which, quite frankly, are legitimate and which we hope to address tonight. That being said, there is a small but very vocal minority of neighboring property owners who oppose this project. We invited them for personal presentations and discussions, including giving them Mr. Boritson's personal phone number to discuss any questions or concerns they may have. But unfortunate to date, very few have shown any interest in meeting with us, let alone speaking to us at all. In recent weeks, there's also been some negative social media and opinion pieces attacking our project, which is regrettable as much of it has been misleading, misguided, and often unfair. We collectively chose not to respond in kind and instead decided to wait and make our case for the project here in this forum where it actually matters. If I can ask one thing of the Commission and the audience tonight, whether you are for or whether you are against this application or you're neutral, it is to listen to our presentation with an open mind. We ask you to judge the actual vision we're putting forward based on the record of this public hearing tonight, not what you may have heard or read elsewhere. We would ask you to consider the tremendous effort we've expended to make this development a special place and the sensitivity we've demonstrated to our neighbors and the community in doing so. We firmly believe the merits of our vision deserve not only your support, but the Commission's approval. We're going to make a concerted effort to move quickly through our presentation, relying primarily on our written submissions to date, so that we have plenty of time to answer your questions, allow input from both proponents and opponents, and hopefully allow the Commission to consider action very soon. So we can be effective, I would ask you to hold any questions during our presentation to the end of that presentation. I suggest you write them down as we go along so you don't forget them. We've got a lot to go through in a fairly short time, and we would appreciate your assistance in this regard. This commission has reviewed a number of zone change master plan applications over the last few years and has become quite adept at evaluating them. Master plan zoning is an incredibly powerful tool that's being used to develop critical properties throughout this community. This commission explicitly reiterated its commitment to the use of master plan zoning in its most recently updated plan of conservation and development. As the commission is aware, these types of master plan applications, like the one you're going to see tonight, are very different from the special permits and site plans that the Commission reviews on a routine and regular basis. Master plans are conceptual plans, and the approval of a master plan does not actually approve any construction whatsoever, but instead sets forth a guide and a framework for the future development of a site, typically over a number of phases and years of implementation. Master plan districts are floating zones, and they can land on various eligible properties, and they prov provide enhanced flexibility in terms of the uses allowed and the bulk and dimensional requirements that are applied. This inherent flexibility permits property owners and developers to reimagine their properties and designers to be creative and propose projects that would not otherwise be allowed. There's a price to pay for that flexibility, though, and that is that the Commission has broad and sweeping discretion to approve or deny these types of applications in their legislative capacity. There are five dis different master plan districts in your zoning regulations, and we're seeking tonight to rezone a portion of the Seaport Marine site from the Marine Commercial District to the Neighborhood Development District, otherwise known as the NDD. It is notable that the Marine Commercial District, which is in place now, already allows a variety of industrial type commercial uses related to boatyards and marinas as well as a number of non-water dependent uses like restaurants and bars and offices and wholesalers and even uses like boarding houses. The NDD designation itself is not a new regulation. It was adopted back in 2005, but it was created with the understanding that there are commercially zoned properties in our villages which are keystone parcels and provide unique opportunities for new development which can enhance the character of the community. The NDD was specifically intended to encourage the reclamation 
and the redevelopment of these keystone properties, especially underutilized commercial parcels, and allow for new construction, renovation, and adaptive reuse. The Seaport, Seaport Marine site is such a keystone site, and it is eligible for this designation as it is at least 150,000 square feet in size, is commercially zoned, and has access to public water and sewer. The NDD explicitly promotes a diversity of housing opportunities in these developments, including especially mixed-use development of a nature that is compatible with surrounding areas. In evaluating master plans submitted under the NDD regulations, the Commission is guided by your plan of conservation and development, the Coastal Management Act, and perhaps most importantly, it must ensure harmony and compatibility with the surrounding village area. In my mind, it is this issue of harmony and compatibility that will be the crux of your work in evaluating our application. I would stress to you that the NDD regulations do not require a property owner or developer to match or to replicate the uses or architectural designs of adjacent or nearby properties. In fact, it's inherently understood that Stonington's villages are distinctively mixed use already, with clusters of older homes on side streets behind and aside commercial and waterfront uses and buildings. It's inevitable then that NDD eligible sites, which must be commercially zoned to begin with, will interface with these village neighborhoods. But this is the important part. They don't need to be extensions of them. They only need to be compatible with them. Harmony does not require everyone playing the same note. You need complementary counterparts. A diversity in land use and design is necessary to create the fabric and tapestry of a successful neighborhood. Master plans must only demonstrate that they fit into a larger context of the commercial, residential, and mixed-use neighborhoods that surround these sites. Now, if approved, a master plan submitted under the NDD regulations becomes a blueprint for the future development of a site. As I mentioned earlier, that development is typically implemented in a series of phases, each of which has to come back before this commission for a detailed individual review, another public hearing, through an engineered site plan approval process. This framework provides an inherent protection for the commission and the community as a whole to make sure that a master plan project is developed in a cohesive, coherent, and deliberate fashion over a number of phases and years. It's important to remember that a project of this complexity also requires other approvals and infrastructure build out, whether it's obtaining permits from the Office of State Traffic Administration from the Connecticut DEP or the Army Corps of Engineers, or upgrading sewer facilities or changing roadways servicing the project. These additional approvals alone can take additional time, sometimes even years, let alone the construction of the project itself. So it's critically important tonight to realize this is not the end of the development and permit process, nor it is even the beginning of the end. At best, tonight is the end of the beginning. And the Commission and other regulators will be intimately involved and remain significantly in control of the various phases of this project going forward to ensure that it's developed responsibly. At each phase, a property owner or developer must verify its initial assumptions and show ongoing compliance with the master plan or seek modifications of that master plan if circumstances or conditions change. As Ms. Lyons and the rest of our team will share with you in a moment, each building and use that is part of our master plan has been carefully designed in concert with the NDD regulations using the NDD's flexibility to create a truly special project. We believe that the NDD regulations were intended to bring new life back to properties, like the Seaport Marine site, to create innovative and exciting mixed-use opportunities out of rundown locations, to generate new vibrancy in our villages and on the waterfront, and to promote economic growth both directly and indirectly from renewed investment throughout this community. Tonight, please join us as we share our vision for Smiler's Wharf. At this time, we're going to move to the actual presentation on the screen. As I understand previously, I think the Commission's going to come down so they can view it. Uh, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to Meg Lyons.
Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm Meg Lyons. Um, I thought I would begin tonight with a bit of background about myself to explain who I am and how I'm connected to Stonington and Mystic. My family moved to Stonington over 40 years ago, so you can consider me a local architect. I have, hold an undergraduate degree in architectural history from Wesleyan University and a master's degree in architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. With 30 years of experience in design and construction, I've worked on a wide range of projects, including eight different master planning and urban planning projects, as well as buildings large and small. I spent 14 years with Centerbrook Architects, where among other things, I was project manager and lead architect on the Ocean House in Watch Hill. I've lived in Boston, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, but chose to come home to Stonington, where my husband and I have raised our daughter. We've lived in the Stonington borough for 24 years. Located on a key site on the Mystic River, the master plan for Smiler's Wharf has the potential to significantly enhance downtown Mystic. Today I'll be reviewing the history of the site and its existing conditions and sharing with you our vision of how it could be transformed. That's essentially the site within the circle. Originally called Pistol Point, the site was historically the location of various manufacturing industries, including shipbuilding, production of steam engines, a woolen mill, and a window blind factory. This diorama from the Mystic Seaport Museum gives us a sense of what this side of the river looked like around 1900. Cottrell Street, ooh, I'm lost. Cottrell Street still ends at Washington, as it does today. Um, and you can see at that location was a very prominent brick mill building that, with a prominent smokestack. This was the J.O. Cottrell Sash and Blind Factory. Willow Street continued into the site as it does today. There is an additional cross street that no longer exists. The most prominent feature of the site was the Mystic Ironworks where steam engines and later textile were produced. Oops. This is an enormous building, 420 feet long. We won't be building anything that size. Um, surely it dominates the landscape. You can, see, you can see the scale of this in relation to the rest of the buildings in Mystic. While both the ironworks factory and the sash and blind mill were gone by the early part of the 20th century, because of its prominent river location, the property continued being used for the, for the manufacturing of boats. In the 1920s, Pistol Point was the location of Franklin Post and Son shipbuilders who specialized in commercial fishing boats and power yachts. Their canny business strategy was to provide boats to both the Coast Guard and the Rum Runners who were trading in contraband alcohol during Prohibition. The Coast Guard boats were outfitted with a single powerful V12 engine, the Rum Runners with three engines. You could hear the roar of the engines up and down Fisher's Island Sound. One of the individuals with deep ties to the syndicate and credited with the design of the boats was Arthur Smiler Rowland. We have taken his nickname as an inspiration for our development. This aerial taken sometime before 1960 indicates that the property was no longer being used for manufacturing activities, but as an industrial shipyard, so it's sort of this zone. It looks pretty much as it does today. Warehouse buildings remain and have grown in number with a footprint covering 67,000 square feet. 
There are a series of docks, finger piers, and boat basins. The restaurant Red 36 sits at the southern um, end of the property. This is obviously Willow Street, and you can see that Willow, though it's paved, it sort of stops and becomes mostly a gravel, gravel roadway. There's Red 36, sorry. So how do we, oh, excuse me, um, from the vehicular point of view, this is what we see at the end of Cottrell Street. Unpainted metal sheds, sagging asphalt roofs, misshapen additions to a building with no front door. In effect, a wall of derelict industrial buildings. Meanwhile, the pedestrian faces a moat with water separating you. This is where the sidewalk ends with no further public access. So how do we transform this key piece of property at the heart of Mystic? How do we take the liveliness an activity of the restaurant scene at Red 36 and connect it back to the rest of Mystic. This is the existing site plan. Red 36 is here, the Allen Spool Mill is there, and all of the gray are the existing warehouses. We propose to demolish the existing warehouses and create a mixed-use development that combines commercial and residential uses with public open space developing seven and a half acres of the total 11.4 acre parcel. We will create a pedestrian spine right down here, all the way to Red 36, um, that extends Cultural Street. That becomes our boardwalk. Much like the Mystic River Park, this will give access to the river's edge. And like communities around the country, we will reclaim the water's edge from our industrial past. The heart of the project is centered around a new boat basin with new investment in infrastructure with bulkheads along the river. This will effectively raise a protective barrier to floodwaters. Framing the entry to the boardwalk on one side is a kayak pavilion, inviting the public out onto the water. The building will be a simple raised wooden platform with awning structures for shade. The plan includes a handicap launch for disabled kayakers, allowing universal accessibility. This is coupled with a bike rack and signage that celebra celebrates the history of the site. The other building that greets the visitor at the end of Cottrell and Washington is a 45-room hotel. It is a five-story building with a ground floor devoted entirely to parking. The building will include an outdoor terrace and a rooftop lounge open to hotel guests for breakfast service and evening cocktails. This hotel's brick architecture is inspired by the tradition of New England mills, like the Cottrell Sash and Blind plant that once stood at this very spot. Continuing up the boardwalk, one arrives at a plaza offering views of the river. This public gathering space of more than 5,000 square feet built over structured parking has stairways and ramps that connect it both to the boardwalk on the west and parking on the east. Facing the plaza the opposite the hotel, is a marine services building that will include commercial office space, bathroom, and laundry facilities for visiting boaters, and a clear span space on the first floor for community meetings, farmers markets, and private events. The building has been designed like a barn with a mixture of clabbered and shingles with twin cupolas on the roof. On the other side of the boat basin is a new 200-seat restaurant like its sister restaurant, Red 36, will combine an interior dining room with outdoor decks. The main restaurant space will be constructed with open metal trusses providing double height space with expansive water views. With a nod to the site's hist uh, industrial heritage, the building exterior will be made with rough hewn wood planks and a corrugated metal roof. 
Continuing through the site, the pedestrian route brings you back down to grade facing a crescent-shaped park with a view of the spool mill. The spool mill is, is actually this gray building right there. The park is envisioned as a public amenity with arcing sitting walls, that's what these are, each 18 inches high. By terracing the grade, the parallel parking behind will effectively be shielded from view. So these will essentially be hidden. The residential component of the project consists of three types of housing. At the bend in the river, we propose an apartment building with 25 units. The building is six stories with the first floor devoted entirely to parking. Responding to the river's edge, the building is gently curved in plan and includes two lower portions, east and west, that help break down the mass and provide variation. The exterior will be clad with wood shiplap siding. On the east side of the property, along a cove, we propose a group of 16 townhouses, which will enjoy more private views of the river and the adjacent wetlands. Each attached residence includes a lower level garage for two cars and two and a half floors of residential space. These structures will be clad with wood shingles and have asphalt roofs. Finally, looping back through the site, we've located six units of multifamily housing along Washington and Willow Street. Each unit is designed as a two bedroom flat. Exteriors will be clabbered with asphalt roofs. To meet FEMA regulations, all new buildings are required to have the first floor habitable space two feet above the base flood elevation of 11, yielding a first floor elevation at 13. Ground floors will be reserved for parking. At Smiler's Wharf, a combination of structured parking and at-grade lots will provide 318 parking spaces on site, supplemented with an additional 106 off-site for a total of 422 parking spaces. Using a reasonable shared parking model, we can accommodate all required parking at the peak period. That would be weekend evenings in the summer. Nine months of the year, we will likely have excess parking. While some new development assumes, meaning other projects, not ours, assumes the existing street grid will absorb growth, Smiler's Wharf will not burden existing street parking. I'm going to say that again. While some new developments elsewhere assume the existing street grid will absorb growth, Smiler's Wharf will not burden existing street parking. Also, keep in mind, if visitors can't find space on the Groton side of the river on the street, they're required to pay for parking. At Smiler's Wharf, 132 parking spaces are unassigned, essentially adding free public parking to downtown Mystic, built by and paid for by the development. The Smiler's Wharf development will even remove snow for free from that, from that parking and no charge to the town. In envisioning the architecture of the project, we looked to historic precedent within Mystic and the surrounding communities. We've looked at important buildings like the main block in terms of massing and materials, the powerhouse and Randall's Row Wharf directly across the river also provide context. Choosing to construct the hotel in brick, for instance, creates a dialogue with those prominent masonry buildings across the river. We looked not just at the heights of buildings, but their lengths and widths to understand general massing and the relationship of the building to the street. In choosing materials for our buildings, again, we looked at the context of downtown Mystic. While the neighboring architecture may feel homogenous, there is actually a good deal of variety, both in style and materials. One finds a preponderance of wood clabbered and shingle, of course, but brick, stone, and metal make appearance with some regularity. Taking all of this as our cue, the buildings at Smiler's Wharf embrace various prototypes and materials. And this shows the kind of variety that we have in architectural style and material. Our intention for site lighting will be to provide safe and efficient circulation without lighting up the night sky. The selected fixtures will 
be low profile with full cutoff to minimize light pollution. The same intention will be applied to signage to provide safe white wayfinding with a lot of, without a lot of excessive graphic noise. Finally, street trees and landscaping are intended to augment the experience of this newly refreshed part of Mystic. One of the prime objectives of the master plan has been to enhance view sheds. Um, the existing warehouses um, create a visual barrier to the river. But by opening up the site, we will be now allow people to see through the property and create new vistas in Mystic. Widening Willow Street and removing derelict warehouses um, will allow the public to have a clear view of the renovated spool mill. Locating a park at the heart of the plan will provide open space and uninterrupted views. By continuing Cultural Street as a pedestrian way, we will reinforce the existing street pattern of Mystic and simultaneously provide a view through the site. By locating the public plaza across from the boat basin, we will create views to the Groton side of Mystic. There's been some concern about the height of some of the proposed buildings at Smiler's Wharf. Keep in mind, we have been tasked with balancing FEMA regulations, which force us to elevate all structures, with economic feasibility and historic precedent. Towards that end, we had neighboring buildings surveyed by an engineer to understand relative heights. Most of the prominent buildings in Mystic fall within the 50 to 60 foot range. Our apartment building at six stories has a cornice line at 67 feet with mechanical penthouses set back from the edge at 74 feet. Five stories of residences above one level of parking is necessary for us to achieve the most modest tier one development. In fact, we don't even reach the tier one threshold of 60 units. This development has only 47. The decision to place the apartment building on the river was a conscious choice, locating the, build, the tallest building where there is space and light around it, rather than on the corner of Willow and Washington, where it would be across the street from two-story residences. Stonington Commons in the borough is a similar model to our apartment building, ground floor parking with residences above. Stonington Commons, some 330 feet long, sits directly on the sidewalk less than 50 feet from two-story residences. Our apartment building is 700 feet from any neighboring houses. While Stonington Commons is not located in downtown Mystic, it is new construction in one of Stonington's villages. Bringing this back to Mystic, let's look at more immediate context to address the concerns about scale within a village setting. The main block sits directly on the sidewalk and rises 53 foot four to the cornice line with mechanical penthouses topping off at 62 feet. Our proposed hotel is set back from the curb by 25 feet with a cornice line at 55 feet with rooftop structures topping off at 63. So in this diagram, I've placed these buildings side by side, um, including the Allen Spool Mill, to give you a sense that we really have kept the scale of Smiler's Wharf's buildings within a reasonable range of other buildings in Mystic and Stonington while still complying with FEMA regulations. Other concerns voiced about Smiler's Wharf is that it is a massive development. In fact, it is not. Compare our floor, floor area ratio. Floor area ratio is the amount of square footage you put on a particular piece of land. With the adjacent, uh, compare ours with the adjacent Cottrell Street zone, DB5. That zone allows a floor area ratio of 0.6. The new buildings at Smiler's Wharf puts our floor area ratio at 0.598. We are completely in keeping with the level of development 
on adjacent properties in Mystic. Density and mass are not just a matter of building height. This, this simple numerical comparison demonstrates that when considering length, width, and height, a truer understanding of a building's impact on a site, our most prominent buildings are consistent with the main block. The numbers make it very clear. In an apples to apples comparison, by taking FEMA out of the equation, shows that our two largest buildings at 52,000 square feet and 35,000 square feet are very much in keeping with the main block at 51,000 square feet, a building we've all been living with for 100 years. In planning Smiler's Wharf, we reviewed and followed the plan of conservation and development, especially the chapter on villages. This project encourages foot and bicycle traffic allows public access to the river, balances floodplain requirements with preservation of character, and supports and strengthens neighboring businesses. The project invests in commercial property and addresses parking issues. We have expanded Mystic Street Grid, developed a network of sidewalks and street trees, added a public park for sought-after open space, maintained water-dependent use, uses, and created a walkable neighborhood all in an effort to further the village characteristics of Mystic. Our intention for this project is not just to develop underused land, but to transform a blighted portion of downtown Mystic. This is an effort in placemaking, connecting it bridge to bridge, framing this piece of river from the historic Bascule Bridge to the swinging railroad bridge. What was once an unwelcoming industrial site will now be an open and inviting way to experience the river's edge. Smiler's Wharf turns what is private property into a public asset. Uh, we now like to share a video created with a 3D model of Smiler's Wharf. The first half of the video takes you from a bird's eye view and flies around the site. And then we come down to more of a pedestrian view and do another circuit.
Jane is now going to join us. Thanks. Thanks. Good evening. <laughs> They're putting a pretty picture for me. Um, so my name is Jane Stahl. Uh, I came to Connecticut 40 years ago with a bachelor's of environmental studies in hand, my master's in natural policy resources and management. Uh, and I came to work for the Department of Environmental Protection as it was, please, go ahead, Sorry. go sit down. Um, as it was developing its federal coastal management program. I left DEP almost 30 years later, having served along the way as both its assistant director of the Office of Long Island Sound programs, and then uh, towards the end as its deputy commissioner for air, waste, and water programs. So this program, this project, brought me back to my roots which reminded me that the coastal management program was built to balance the development of our shoreline between natural resource protections, water dependent use protections, and economic development. And it was built to balance the jurisdictions of state authorities and local home rule that Connecticut is so proud of. There wouldn't be a coastal management program in Connecticut if it were a state-run program. Local home rule was key to its development and its success because it is the local municipalities with their knowledge of the, um, their people and their interests and their needs to protect though and balance those natural resources, water dependent uses and property rights that could not be handled at the state level. The basis for the decision making under the Coastal Management Act are a series of policies and standards that apply at each level of government. In this instance, the decision resides with the Municipal Planning and Zoning Commission as to whether or not to rezone this site. DEP's mission is not the same as the municipality's mission. Its mission is, its mission is to promote those same interests, but from a farther distance. So the main areas of coastal consistency review associated with this project are the same areas that are uh, within not only your jurisdiction, but within your plan of conservation and development. So I want to talk tonight a little bit about water dependent uses and then touch briefly on coastal hazard areas and flood management and tidal wetlands, both of which you'll hear much more about from our civil engineer and our wetlands expert. So the rubric that the Coastal Management Act provides for you in talking about water dependent uses begins with the site. Is the site suitable for water dependent use? This site clearly is. Um, of the 11 plus acres, Eight are engineered and previously disturbed upland. It's got about 2,000 feet of waterfront and direct access to navigable waters. The other three plus minus acres are tidal wetlands, not suitable for water dependent use, but needing to be protected and preserved. So what water dependent uses is this site suited to? Well, our focus here is on marinas, recreational and commercial boating facilities, shipyards, boat buildings, and water-based recreation, and uses which provide general public access to marine or tidal waters. These are all uses that are defined by the Coastal Management Act as water dependent. 
I've left out industrial and commercial uses that need large amount of cooling waters because that's not fitting for this site with its various constraints. So let's talk a little bit more about that. We've mentioned about the three acres that are tidal wetland and the wetland proper and its landward edge are not suitable for water dependent uses. They need to be protected and preserved. The site is situated in a densely populated, settled, narrow streeted historic village community. It's bounded by and hosts an infill area of residential development and the movement of large boats to and from storage at the site ranges from difficult to unsafe to inconsistent with adjacent use. The noises associated with shipyards and boat maintenance also range from inconvenient to inconsistent with the adjacent uses. The northern boundary of the site, however, is the municipal Mystic River Park. The park provides the opportunity for a natural continuous public access way to and along the site, while the site provides the opportunity to strengthen the linkage to Mystic Village, its residential, commercial, and neighboring open space areas. The direct waterfront access further provides visual access to the scenic areas riverward of the site. The site also provides some gently sloped intertidal areas that are potentially available for small boat access and other water-based recreational activities. So those are the water-dependent uses for which this site is suited. So is this proposal then a water-dependent use? Yes, in meaningful and substantial ways. The project as proposed would retain and enhance a local and regionally significant marina with an increase in in-water slips and piers and dockside marina services. It will diversify the slip sizes in boats that it accommodates. It will provide for transient dockage. It will provide for pump out facilities, minor boat repair capabilities on site, and importantly, a full range of boat maintenance surfaces at its nearby sister facility. So in whole, we're not losing those boat services, we're migrating them to a location that can better accommodate them. There will be on-site marina offices, administrative offices, there can be boat sales, all of those um, uses that are associated with marinas but are not formally water-dependent uses. We're providing a small boat rental and launch area to enhance water-based recreational uses. Again, a statutorily defined water-dependent use. And emphasizing the fact that there's new meaningful public access to and along the Mystic River, not just a walkway, but a walkway that leads to an open public gathering space. So again, the uniqueness of this site and its availability to enhance tourism, something that's also talked about in your plan of conservation and development um, for this site, short walk from the downtown Mystic area, accessible to thousands of visitors, to one of Connecticut's main tourist attractions. So the master plan invites those tourists to a newly available waterfront riverwalk and riverfront at plaza. Are there adverse impacts to water dependent uses? Yes, but those adverse impacts are acceptable. And that's an important part of the rubric that's contained in the Coastal Management Act. This is not a take it or leave it, one and done consideration that you are charged with. We are eliminating some existing boat maintenance activities as well as the launch and haul facilities and boat storage. We'd be utilizing a significant portion of the remaining upland for non-water dependent uses. These are, by definition, adverse impacts on water dependent use. But they're acceptable, and here's why. These adverse impacts cannot be avoided. This site 
these current boat repair facilities cannot and will not be sustained on site. They're housed in derelict buildings. The infrastructure needed to support them is not financially sustained by the uses that they support. The services are already being diverted to a more suitable nearby sister facility and they will continue to migrate. So that use will be lost to this site one way or another. The economics of modern marina infrastructure require the kind of financial support unavailable from marine services alone. And the neighborhood and village surrounds, which are assets in so many ways, constrains the use of this site for moving large boats and providing what can quite frankly be noisy, dirty operations. So they can't be avoided, these adverse impacts. But they're being minimized. As I said, all the in-water services are being maintained and enhanced, including the removal of historically filled land and its return to both a natural resource of value and a boat basin to enhance transient boaters' visits. The remaining adverse impacts are being mitigated. So the, the kind of holy trinity of water-dependent use analysis, as well as we'll see later natural resource um, evaluations. Avoid, minimize, mitigate. So the mitigation, the creation of the small boat access area and significant public access that would otherwise be unavailable to and through the site and creates this continuum of access from Mystic River Park and on up to and through the village. And again, unique to this project proponent, the ability to maintain active launch and haul services, repair and maintenance services not here in Mystic, where it doesn't fit, but at its sister yard, where it does. So that's the water-dependent use analysis that is available to you and for your consideration. Briefly, coastal hazard area and flood management. Smiler's Wharf is what is defined, is in what's defined as the coastal hazard area. As I believe all of Mystic, Stonington and Groton sides are. The coastal management statutes do not prohibit residential uses in coastal hazard areas. They require consideration of how to minimize impacts to life and property. Now, to deep, that may mean disallowing any new residential uses but to a municipality that has to or wants to provide housing within an economically sustainable mixed-use plan, it means meeting all FEMA requirements, which we are doing, improving site-wide elevations and providing first time ever stormwater management to improve drier access and egress, which we are doing, Implementing a real-time, on-site, early warning and evacuation system, which we are doing, and creating a living shoreline surrounding the townhouse area to avoid the need for future flood and erosion control structures while improving our tidal wetlands protections. So we understand Deep's concerns but we account for them in the context of this comprehensive, sustainable plan. And finally, a little bit about the tidal wetlands. And as you'll hear in a moment, the tidal wetlands on this site range from totally degraded to lush and healthy. Our plan was designed to preserve and protect the existing healthy tidal wetlands and restore and enhance the degraded wetlands. The townhouse area is a minimum of 15 feet from any tidal wetland boundary. We're using that 15 feet to create a living shoreline which will protect the wetlands to naturally, um, uh, to allow them to naturally migrate inland by virtue of the grading and the vegetation that we will place as part of that living shoreline. 
It's our concept to avoid future need for structural flood and erosion control structures for the townhouses by virtue of that design element. Additionally, and importantly, we'll be eradicating Phragmites and site-wide which will enhance the health and the existing degraded wetlands and protect the healthy wetlands from being encroached upon and degraded by invasive species which would otherwise occur. So in addition to the Phragmites eradication, a program of removing invasives from the existing degraded wetlands will be undertaken. The lawn area, which is tidal wetlands but mown as a lawn now, will be returned to wetland. None of this, none of these protections and enhancements of tidal wetlands will occur without this program for the site. So these analyses, water dependent use, flood, um, flood hazard area and flood management, and tidal wetlands protections, apply equally to your determine of co determination of coastal consistency as they do with your determination of consistency with your own plan of conservation and development. So these are your determinations to make. That was the construct of the Coastal Management Act. And based on the information that's in our, that's been previously submitted to the record and I think enhanced here tonight through the presentation, we believe that you can make that finding of consistency. So thank you. And now for more detail, I'll turn it over to Ron Nolts, our civil engineer. myself. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Nault. I have a, a bachelor's and master's degree in civil and environmental engineering. And I'm a professional engineer here in Connecticut. I'm a principal of the engineering firm of Luke's Consulting Engineers, 35 years experience including similar coastal redevelopment projects. The master plan for redeveloping the Seaport Marine site as Smiler's Wharf was guided by the basic principles, as Jane alluded, uh, avoidance, minimization, and mitigation, while also providing an economically sustainable upland plan to support the site's water-dependent components through mixed-use development. In general terms, we sought to protect and preserve the areas of healthy resources and tidal wetlands through avoidance of development in these areas and focusing redevelopment on those areas of existing man-made disturbed portions of the site. This will result in an improvement in the land-water interface with a stabilized shoreline and adjacent upland buffer zones, including the living shoreline. The proposed development plan will also provide a significant improvement in stormwater runoff quality by collecting, storing, infiltrating, and treating runoff prior to discharge into the Mystic River and wetlands. To illustrate the proposed improvements, we'll take you through a review of the existing conditions before we move into the engineering proportions of the proposed site development plan. Starting at the northwest corner of the site adjacent to the Mystic River Park, at the corner of Cottrell and Washington Streets, this area is dominated by a heavily man-made and impacted shoreline in the boat launch and boat service area. As seen in these photos, The, as seen in these photos and the plan of existing conditions, the land water interface is a low-lying angular geometry of wood cribbing and crushed stone com 
comprising a derelict bulkhead and unprotected shoreline structure. Frequent tidal flooding and decay result in driving forces for erosion and sedimentation of the upland directly into the Mystic River and adjacent coves and bays. Moving further south along the shoreline, the site takes us into the area of active marine use and the Red 36 restaurant. This area will remain completely undisturbed and we won't spend much time on this segment. Continuing to the southern area of the site, the shoreline brings us further along the Mystic River and into the start of the Cove area. Existing dockhead elevated walkways take boaters from the upland areas to the major active marina boat slip areas of Seaport Marine. The shoreline here degrades into an area of invasive phragmites and knotweed thickets, yielding very little nat natural resource habitat, as Rich Snarsky will soon dis discuss in more detail. Continuing along the shoreline and inland of the open cove and wetlands takes us to a low-lying but developed lawn area and office building that are not part of this project. Again, this area will remain unchanged and we won't spend much time in this area. Continuing north and approaching Washington Street, the shoreline is a disturbed zone of man-made landforms rising to existing lawn areas. Completing the traverse by moving easterly, we reach the area of healthy tidal wetland marshes. This area will remain completely undisturbed. It's important to note that there are no stormwater management measures currently employed at the site. Stormwater, run stormwater runoff now flows unabated across the site and discharges directly to the Mystic River Basin with suspended solids, oil and grease, nutrients, and other contaminants. That means that the wetlands and water quality are adversely impacted by routine, routine stormwater runoff under existing conditions. Now Rich Snarsky will review the existing natural resources of the site and opportunities for mitigation measures. Uh, my name is Rich Snarsky. I'm a professional wetland scientist and a registered soil scientist. I've been uh, delineating wetlands in the town of Stonington for 36 years. I also specialize. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, I also specialize in wetland restoration and creation. Um, I delineated the uh, tidal wetland boundary on this parcel. As shown in the site plan to the right is where the tidal marsh, the three acre tidal marsh occurs. Um, let me just back up a minute. Um, as Ron mentioned, the western side of the property is pretty much all urbanized and there's no tidal wetlands along the Mystic River. It's pretty much bulkheads and... Uh, oh. oh, I pushed it. Okay, sorry. Um, the tidal wetlands begin at this area here, a little past the restaurant, the eastern side of the restaurant. And then as we go up northerly, here's the cove area. And all these different colors are the different vegetation types within the tidal marsh. A portion of the tidal marsh is degraded by the exotic invasive plant Phragmites, which occurs dominantly in this area, this area, and along in here. This section is a healthy tidal moss, which is composed of all native vegetation, tidal one species. Part of the proposal is to enhance the shoreline with a t along the tidal marsh. In this area here, which is dominated by J Japanese knotweed and also Phragmites in here, and Japanese knotweed and Phragmites here, will be eradicated and it'll be restored to create a healthy living shoreline which will be involved in planting native shrub species and or native herbaceous plant species. In addition, Ron, how do you move that picture up to... This is the area where that's dominated by Japanese knotweed and Phragmites. 
And this area will be restored to a natural living shoreline with all native species, which I was just mentioning. Um, in addition, yeah, we can go yeah, here's the Phragmites along the shoreline here. And over here on the eastern side is a healthy tidal marsh. But all the Phragmites throughout the whole tidal wetland marsh system will be eradicated, and this will increase the habitat value for shoreline birds such as egrets and herons, which also frequent the area, mostly on the eastern side of the marshland over here. This is a cross-section of the uh, living shoreline. We're here. We'll be eradicating the um, exotic invasive plants. Here's the Phragmites, Japanese knotweed, and then be planting native shrubland species in here to create a native plant community, which will blend down into the tidal marsh system, which we're calling a living shoreline. Thanks, Rich. Looking ahead to the uh, proposed conditions, um, as mentioned earlier, Smilers Wharf Redevelopment seeks to protect the healthy resources and marshes by avoiding work in those areas, focusing on the disturbed. The proposed redevelopment plan will result in an improved shoreline zone, improved shoreline buffer, promoting healthy tidal wetlands ecosystem, more open space, more public access, and more subtitle and open water habitat. <clears throat> As Meg showed you the proposed architectural master plan, I will focus on the proposed supporting engineering and infrastructure aspects. First, the shoreline. Again, starting at the northwest corner, matching to and protecting the flank of the town's bulkhead at the center of the park, at the end of the park, Seaport Marine proposes to continue the bulkhead and cap, bulkhead and cap on their property around the shoreline to create a stabilized shoreline resistant to erosion, turbidity, and debris release. The bulkhead and cap will allow construction of an adjacent public boardwalk welcoming visitors onto and around the Seaport Marine site as shown. The uh, green areas are public access um, extension from Cottrell Street straight down onto the boardwalk to the plaza area that Meg showed, continuing around uh, the hotel uh, leading to the edge of Red 36, including the Crescent Park in that area. <clears throat> It is also proposed to remove two areas of man-made fill totaling approximately 14,000 square feet to create an enlarged open water basin to enhance transient marine capabilities to attract boating tourism. The new, in this area here and here, those upland areas will be uh, removed and created as open basin. The new shoreline sheet pile bulkhead will be installed landward of the existing timber cribbing and crushed stone shoreline and provide for its removal. The proposed shoreline sheet pile bulkhead will be extended southerly to tie into a stabilized riprap shoreline at the beginning of the marina boat slip operations. So the bulkhead would connect to the park bulkhead here, extend around the shoreline basin, around the existing landform here, and connect to an area of stabilized uh, riprap uh, faced shoreline. <clears throat> the existing shoreline will remain undisturbed from here southerly to and around the Red 36 restaurant area to the beginning of the peninsula and land between the Mystic River and Cove Embayment. So undisturbed through here around the restaurant over to that point. Moving, f <clears throat> the shoreline around the perimeter of the South Peninsula is comprised of the degraded zone, as Rich described, dominated by invasive knotweed and phragmites. The plan is to create a living shoreline buffer enhancement along this entire stretch. If you can see in green, but uh, the area of invasives and knotweed, phragmites removed, and the living shoreline uh, encircling this 
uh, peninsula here, as well as a living shoreline along the flanks of the degraded zone uh, there um, to, the, to the north. <clears throat> Continuing north as we approach Washington Street, the same living shoreline leading to the undisturbed portion of the healthy tidal marsh along the eastern side of the site. So sum summarizing the shoreline interface, the result of the proposed measures will be a stabilized shoreline yielding a resilient coastline to resist storm and sea level forces. Existing degraded areas of invasives uh, in the non-infringement zone will be improved through the eradication and impl implementation of the living shoreline. Now moving to the upland development, the site will be served by a well-organized and delineated network of driveways, sidewalks, and parking areas. This will result in improved safety by designing for emergency vehicle access and better overall traffic and pedestrian management. The main development access will be uh, extension of Willow Street into the site uh, with uh, a roundabout feature all designed for fire truck access, surface parking areas, all well delineated surface parking areas here as well uh, around the site. Full utility infrastructure will be provided with potable and fire protection water supply, wastewater collection once the interconnection to the Mystic plant has been implemented, as well as electric and communication service. As part of the proposed upland redevelopment plan, a completely new stormwater management system will be implemented to meet or exceed the town and state deep standards for collection, detention, infiltration, and treatment. Stormwater management plan will utilize structural and non-structural best management practices, such as pervious pavement to reduce runoff and promote infiltration, infiltration trenches to collect and infiltrate runoff, rain gardens to reduce contaminants and promote infiltration, perforated conveyance pipe to allow detention and infiltration. We like infiltration. Catch basins with hoods and sumps to collect runoff and reduce trash and oil discharge. Subsurface detention and infiltration systems typically under parking areas to store runoff to reduce peak flows and promote infiltration. And finally, outfall treatment and discharge. Exact locations will be finalized with each individual site plan application. During the construction phase, measures will be included to prevent soil erosion and sedimentation, such as silt fence, hay bales, sediment basins, and turbidity curtains. These, these measures will represent a significant improvement to the water quality on and adjacent to the site, removing such contaminants as suspended solids, oil and grease, metals, nutrients, and trash. And lastly, flood mitigation. The impacts of sea level rise have been fully considered in the development of Smiler's Wharf site plan. These measures include shoreline, stabilization, shoreline stabilization of the current dilapidated timber bulkhead into an elevated sh structural shoreline, provision of living shoreline in areas of distressed non-structural shoreline now dominated by invasives, elevating the site for allow, to allow for better access and egress, and a vigorous stormwater, management fe vigorous stormwater management features to reduce flooding and drastically improve stormwater runoff quality. Now Ron Dagan will review the site parking plan. Good evening. I'm Ron Dagan. I'm a professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. I hold an engineering degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in transportation engineering. Uh, I have over 30 years of experience providing traffic engineering consultation in the state of Connecticut, and I'm a principal at Loops Consulting Engineers. I'm here to talk about the parking, demand, and supply. Uh, parking on site was given careful consideration to provide adequate parking, but also reflecting the mixed use site design and the shared parking potential as recognized by the Neighborhood Development District and DD zoning regulations. 
I'd like to briefly go over the process we went through to determine uh, the adequacy of parking in the proposed site. First, we determined the parking requirements for each individual proposed building use, uh, building use, following the zoning regulation of the town of Stonington. This represents the parking demand as it, for each building as it is used independently and at full occupation at the same time. Next, we wanted to reflect reality where some of the parking spaces within the project area can be shared by different uses at different times. This was done to avoid building large parking lots, which, whoop, we'll leave it alone, uh, which build, will be vacant, which would not serve the desired visual image of the proposed project and the town of Mystic. This is recognized in both the town zoning regs for NDD development and the Institute of Transportation Engineer, ITE, parking generation, generation manual. I'll briefly go over each of the uh, site parking requirements. Starting with hotel, apartments, townhouses. You can fix it? Yeah, pardon me. No problem. I could have done that. Thanks. Yeah. For the hotel, apartments, townhouses, and multifamily houses, we assumed that there'll be no sharing of parking. Each required parking space, as uh, determined by your zoning regs, was provided. We also assumed full occupancy at the time of the analysis. Next comes the assembly area for special events. It is assumed that the activities at those areas generally will be scheduled off-peak at noon and afternoon hours during the summer season or during the off-season. In the rare instance where the function is to take place in the evening at the peak summer season, off-site parking conditions with shuttle service would be stipulated in the lease agreement with the event organizers. The Marine Service Office. It is expected that the Marine Office will be occupied during regular working hours, which do not coincide with the peak hours, and therefore those numbers were adjusted. The Boat Slips and Kayak pa Pavilion. It is reasonable to assume that 15 to 20 percent of the Boat Slip users are expected to stay on site and accommodated in the hotel or residences parking area, thus reducing the required parking spaces. In addition, 35 slips will be kept for boaters that are transient visitors who do not require parking. Red 36 restaurant and the new restaurant. In order to faithfully reflect experience con expected conditions, the total number of required parking spaces for the restaurants needed to be adjusted and modified to account for two elements. The first one is due to the proximity of the restaurants to downtown Mystic and the extension of the pedestrian boardwalk. It is conservatively anticipated that 10% of the restaurant visitors would walk from other locations that would not need parking space. In addition, following the recommendations of the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Handbook, it is expected that during the peak hour, 9% of the restaurant traffic would be internal from the hotel apartments and townhouses already parked on the site. In summary, as shown on the table, the total parking demand for visitors and residents for all uses listed herein is 264 parking spaces. In addition, 53 parking spaces would be required, eight for the hotel staff, 15 for the Red 36 restaurant staff, and 30 for the new restaurant, totaling 317 spaces in all. Now what is the parking space provided? On the site, the plan provides 318 parking spaces. It is evident that there is enough parking space available to accommodate both visitors, residents, and staff within the on-site parking lots. 
it should be noted that in reality, the owners will require all employees to park at the Mystic Packer building during peak busy time. I keep doing that, I'm sorry. Thanks. I'll repeat, it should be noted that in reality, the owners will require all employees to park at the Mystic Packer building during peak busy times and free up 53 additional parking on sites for customers and the public. In addition to that, to provide additional safety margin, 54 additional parking spaces within walking distance are proposed at the medical office building, which is adjacent to the development. Uh, can you point to it? No, I will. It can be the pointer. Right there. So at the medical office building and at the Mystic Oil site. So as you can see, not only does our on-site parking, available parking, exceed the demand, we also have a safety margin of 54 spaces within walking distance to the uh, project. So in summary, as uh, Meg said, we not only provide enough parking for the development, we actually have over 50 spaces above and beyond what is required. Thank you. With that, Ron. <clears throat> um, summarizing the engineering components, uh, with the Smilers Wharf redevelopment plan, we, we have sought to preserve and protect the healthy natural resources by avoiding any work any work in the most sensitive areas of the cove area and east side of the site, improve the degraded site in areas of impacted natural resources, such as uh, removal of invasives and creation of the living shoreline uh, enhanced buffer, replacing the derelict shoreline structures that, allowed for, that allow for erosion and sedimentation into the river without a stabilized shoreline, Removal of 14,000 square feet of man-made fill areas to regain open water and benthic bottomland habitat. Design for flood mitigation using widely accepted engineering and environmental measures. Provision of a well-organized and delineated network of driveways, sidewalks, and parking areas for improved safety and access for emergency vehicles and provision of stormwater management systems to per collect, detain, infiltrate, and treat runoff before entering the river and wetlands with full supporting utility infrastructure. This master plan provides an economically sustainable upland plan to support the site cleanup, addition of public access, and to enhance the active boating components to create a destination marina experience complementary to the character of Mystic. Thank you. Todd. Good evening, my name is Todd Brayton. I'm with Bryant Associates, and we did the traffic study for this development. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as a Master's degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering with an emphasis on Transportation Engineering. Uh, I've taken numerous training courses for traffic. I have over 20 years experience working on, on traffic studies throughout New England, including similar uh, mixed-use developments. I'm a professional engineer, and I'm a member of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. The study area shown up on the screen includes the intersections of East Main Street and Cottrell Street, East Main Street and Home Street, East Main Street and Willow Street, East Main Street and Broadway Avenue, Broadway Avenue and Washington Street, and then in front of the site at Washington Street and Willow Street. We collected uh, turning movement counts, which was counting the cars turning at each of these intersections uh, during the last summer in August, uh, in the morning and afternoon peak periods, as well as on a Saturday. We did a field review of the existing area, looking at stopping site distances, location of existing utilities, 
posted speed limits, traffic control devices, et cetera. We requested and received crash data from the Stonington Police Department uh, from the beginning of 2015 until almost the end of 2018. We also collected speed data on Washington Street in the vicinity of Willow Street. So, so using the, the traffic data that we collected, we, uh, because the development is going to be a phased development, as mentioned earlier, it's going to take a few years for it to be developed. Uh, so we used a growth rate from the uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation of 0.16 uh, per year uh, to bring that up to the expected traffic volumes at the time that the development would be opened. We used uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation to uh, estimate the amount of trips that the development would generate. Uh, for all, all the uses on the site. And then based on, on this existing data plus the proposed data, we actually did the capacity analysis for each of these intersections to see what the impact would be from the development. We used the Highway Capacity Manual uh, 2016 and Synchro 10 uh, traffic modeling software, which uses the concept of level of service uh, level service A being the most favorable conditions, level service F being the least favorable. I do want to point out that uh, the town is currently investigating the potential for changing Cottrell Street to a one-way street in the southbound direction from East Main Street towards the site. And this is something that based on our analysis, we, uh, we found that there's poor levels of service at the intersection of East Main Street and Home Street, uh, sorry, East Main Street and Cottrell Street. Uh, existing and as well as, as bills, so this is something that probably should be done regardless of how uh, this development uh, moves forward. Uh, so we, we did our capacity analysis for the existing uh, conditions, the future no builds of 2024 and a future build condition in, also in 2024. For the AM peak hour, uh, we found that there would be no change during the, uh, from the bill to, from the no build to build conditions except for the westbound approach of Broadway Avenue at Washington Street, which changes from level service B to level service C. All other approaches would operate at LOS level service C or better. For the PM peak hour, uh, the eastbound approach of Washington Street at the Willow Street intersection changes from LOS A to LOS B, from no build to build conditions. All approaches remain the same. All other approaches remain the same and operate at level of service D or better. For the Saturday peak hour, the northbound approach of Willow Street at East Main Street changes from level of service C to level of service D. And the eastbound approach of Washington Street at Broadway Avenue changes from level of service C to level of service D. All other approaches remain the same and operate at level of service D or better. We looked at the site distance at the intersection of Washington Street and Willow Street. It's actually wasn't specifically required because it's an always stop condition, so everyone's required to stop when they approach the intersection. But however, it's be conservative. We looked at the site distance, and based on the 25 mile, mile per hour design speed, based on the speed study that we did, the site distance on all approaches exceeds the minimum required by Ashto's a policy on geometric design of highways and streets. We reviewed the crash data that we received from the Southern the Police Department and the, and the crashes that occurred over the nearly four year period that we collected the data for does not indicate the presence of unusual conditions that might be worsened by the proposed development. We also reviewed site circulation, which Ron talked about earlier and found that uh, there is adequate access for pedestrians as well as for emergency vehicles. And as the other round mentioned, uh, we found that there's adequate parking uh, for the development. In conclusion, the always soft control, traffic control at the intersection of Willow Street and Washington Street provides safe access for traffic passing or utilizing the site. There are no existing unsafe conditions in the vicinity of the development that might be worsened by the addition of the anticipated traffic. Based upon the analysis, traffic operations on surrounding roadways and intersections will not experience undue congestion with the addition of the traffic generated by the proposed mixed use development. No reduction in safety will occur due to development as proposed.
So LOS is level of service, and that's just an indication of the how well the operate the intersection will operate. We're going to take a 10 minute break, please. Please take this seat so we can get uh, going, <coughs> moving, moving along. They have 15 minutes more of the presentation, and that is it. Then we'll take questions. Good evening, Chairman, member of the Commission. My name is Donald Poland. I'm with the firm of Goman York. We are based in East Hartford, Connecticut, and we provide real estate advisory services uh, to both public sector and private sector clients. My position is man managing director of planning. I oversee all of our planning work, our developer work, and also our real estate analysis work. I'm here tonight to present to you the Municipal Fiscal Impact Statement. It's uh, required by Section 8-4.3 Master Plans and also Section 8.8.2.1 Municipal Fiscal Impacts in your zoning regulations. You were provided with a detailed report and I will simply provide a summary here tonight. All my research into municipal fiscal impacts starts with demographic analysis. And there's a few things I wanna point out uh, to you this evening that are important ultimately when we get to uh, the projections around school-aged children. This table up in the left-hand corner here provides households by type from 1970 to 2012. If you look at this section of it, the, the lowest set of the bars moving across. This is married couples with children from 1970 to 2012. Married couples with children in 1970 made up 40.3% of the population. Today they only make up 19.6% uh, of the total households. We have a changing demographic structure that's changing the municipal needs of communities. The median age of the United States is 38. The median age of the state of Connecticut is 40.3, and Stonington's is 47.2. Aging communities have fewer school-aged children or fewer young children than young communities. Your school enrollments have declined by 488 students since the 2009-2010 year. 
uh, school year. That's approximately 20% of your total school enrollments over a 10 year period. 68.1% of your households are one and two person households and family households with children account for only 22.5% of your total households. For this report, we did an analysis of essentially what was the prior property before Red 36 and what were the taxes and impacts uh, that it was creating for the community. It was a fiscal positive of $50,000, approximately $50,000 per year. We then did an analysis in the report of the property with Red 56, uh, 36, and what we see is a municipal fiscal impact that's once again positive at about $77,000 per year. In the report, we did another analysis after the redevelopment of the site, and we arrived at a municipal fiscal impact of $120,000 per year. Other impacts that we took a look at were the direct impacts of jobs, of also uh, the local tax revenue, which I just mentioned, the one-time development fees from permitting and WPCA connections of approximately a ha uh, 600, 000, over $600,000. I want to just put that in context. The permitting fees for this development will make up about one-third of the Mystic to Stonington Borough sewer connection cost. That's how much is coming in just permitting alone. Economic act, overall economic activity around 18 million, state sales tax revenue around 2.5 million, and direct consumer spending from the residential units on the site in the local community, approximately $300,000. The thing I want to make clear in my presentation tonight is really about the conservativeness of my calculations. Uh, I face two challenges when I'm presenting these numbers to you. One is, if I present really positive numbers, uh, you guys are likely to question the validity of my numbers. Number two, if I'm overly positive and then I have to come back before you in the future, my credibility can be questioned. So I'm always extremely cautious in the numbers that I provide. And I want to explain a little bit of that. So the first thing I did was calculate your total number of housing units uh, against your school enrollments. Your existing housing stock generates 0 0.216 students per house. The multipliers from the Rutgers demographic analysis that I use equal approximately 0 0.025. So my projection number is actually higher than what your existing housing stock is producing. With that, I come up with a projection that the 47 units will generate 12 school age children. Once again, put in context, you've lost 488 students over the past 10 years. If I take your total budget, divide it by your total enrollments, we end up with 18,000, approximately $18,000 per pupil spending. If I back out or account for the state share or the state aid that you receive that's not uh, burdening, that's taking the burden off your tax base, then I come up with a number of 17,500 for per pupil spending. That is the number I use throughout the report. However, I could also go into yours, and I didn't do this in the report, I could go in and do an allocated expenditure. I can look at your BOE budget, and I can say what expenditures are likely to be impacted by new enrollments. And when I do that, I essentially can identify about 34% of the budget. Things like district office staff. Every time you add a student, you don't add a superintendent, nor do you add principals, nor do you add administrative assistants. Utilities are fixed costs regardless of enrollments, building maintenance and operation, you get the picture. If I back that out, say that 34%, then we get down to a per pupil spending of 11,500. Uh, once again, for total spend in the report, I used $210,000, but with the allocated expenditures against 12 students, we would end up at 138. The next column here, NTD, is actually new to district. We always assume these 12 enrollments will be new to the Stonington district. Research that I've been involved in, evaluation of specific towns, education uh, enrollments, has identified that only about 25% are new to dist district. So I could back those other 
nine out and apply these numbers only to that, coming up with 52,000 based on the report's numbers or 34,000 based on the allocated expenditure. So this arrives us at a place. In the report, these were my numbers, 493,000 or 94,000 in tax revenue, 33% allocated to local government, that's your, just your municipal uh, government operations, and 210,000 allocated to education. Total expenditures would be 373,000, and you guys end up with a fiscal positive of 120, 120, 719,000. The detailed calculations I just provided you. Revenues stay the same. I backed off to 27% on the local government spending because actually the detailed narrative in my report actually said that studies show, including Connecticut Conference for Municipalities, that 27% goes to local government spending. I rounded up to be conservative to 33%. Right there is a $30,000 difference. I then used the new to district numbers and then ultimately total expenditures and you guys end up at 325,000. The fact that you've lost 488 students over the past 10 years, I'm confident I can come in here and say 12 new enrollments over 13 grades is actually gonna have zero fiscal impact on the budget. You can absorb 12 students over 13 grades. My point here being is the fiscal impact is actually much, much more positive than the 120,000, which is a very conservative number. So my end finding all in all is that this, pro this project is a net fiscal positive. It will add construction jobs, it'll add permanent jobs, it'll add new uh, consumer spending drawn into the community from outside, and it will add new consumer spending within the community from the development itself, and ultimately it will have a positive fiscal impact on your municipal revenues and expenditures. Thank you. I'm the last speaker, thankfully. Um, we want to thank you, all of you, uh, for your time and attention this evening. Uh, it's important that we leave sufficient time for questions from the commission as well as input from the public. Uh, as you evaluate uh, the commission, as you evaluate your, the application tonight, your charge is going to be primarily directed by your plan of conservation and development. Uh, your staff has done a very thorough job, as usual, in outlining the key sections of the plan that apply to this application. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but I would direct you to the pages of this month's and last month's staff reports, which I think shows a tremendous consistency between the goals of the different chapters of your plan and what Smiler's Wharf offers this community. While the future land use plan in your plan of development shows this site remaining marine commercial, the use of the NDD is specifically allowed within the Marine Commercial District and is actually mentioned in the discussion of development opportunities within the plan. I'm also particularly struck with the elements of our proposal that we've shared with you tonight that enhance coastal resiliency, that promote walkable mixed-use village development that supports underutilized commercial sites, the portions of our plan that creates new and meaningful public access to the waterfront and supports both new and existing village businesses for the benefit of both residents and visitors. I would caution the Commission going forward to avoid cherry-picking specific goals and objectives of the plan and instead compare the plan holistically to the project as a whole and the overall intention of the document. There is no doubt that this is an important project for all of Mystic, and it will certainly create change. But change is not a bad thing in and of itself. In fact, I would submit to you that communities that want to keep things the same must be willing to change. I'm going to say that again like Meg did before with one of her comments. Communities that want to stay this, keep things the same must be willing to change. That might be a difficult concept to grasp the first time you hear it, 
but communities must continue to grow if they want to survive, or they will inevitably wither on the vine and die. Strong communities keep what is good, they get rid of what is bad, and they always look for opportunities to improve what could be better. We believe Smiler's Wharf is one of these opportunities to better Mystic, and it offers the potential to remake and vastly improve this keystone site along the Mystic River. At the end of the day, you'll need to weigh our consistency with your plan, as well as our harmony and compatibility with the rest of Mystic as a whole. The decision whether this project will go forward is not mine, it is not my clients, nor is it the decision of business leaders, neighbors, newspaper columnists, or your staff. That decision is yours alone as a commission, and it is a decision you'll need to make for the entire town of Stonington, not just a single constituency or interest group. That being said, I would urge you to support our vision, my client's desire to create a new and unique place with robust public access and high quality residences, entertainment venues, and marina services on this critically important parcel at the gateway to the Mystic River. This Keystone property is far too important to be left as an empty boatyard. We believe Smiler's Wharf will be a special place that we can all be proud of and will only enhance the character of Mystic for many years to come. I want to thank you for your attention this evening. My entire team will remain available if you have any questions, and we obviously reserve the right of any rebuttal. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jason Vince. I'm the director of planning. Uh, the chairman has asked me to give you a summary of the master plan process, ha how it works in Stonington. The master plan zoning tool is an alternative zoning framework that can be used by properties that are eligible to use the tool. Zoning has three different types of zones. Base zones, which is the existing zoning map. There's overlays, which have rules that allow more things or have more restrictions. And then there's these floating zones called master plan districts. The NDD is a master plan district. And the way that it works is the first step is for the commission to consider rezoning the property to a master plan. Tonight's presentation is for that. If the property is rezoned to a master plan, as approached by this applicant, they would have to come back to implement any phase of that project through a public hearing process. So the master plan creates the overall framework as to what could be built, but then what comes back in the future has to be reviewed at that time and date. I think the, uh, the presentation this night, tonight said that no construction is enabled as a result of this master plan approval. That's how this works. In the future, if a master plan, a master plan comes in to be implemented and the plan is materially different than what was presented tonight, they would have to come in for an amendment of the master plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Keith is going to read the, the letter from DEP, please. Sure. These are the comments we received from uh, DEP's Office of Long Island Sound programs on uh, May 28th. And 
This is from Brian Thompson, Director of the Land and Water Resources Division, Bureau of Water Protection and Land Reuse. So uh, this is a long letter, so uh, bear with me. But it says, Dear Commissioners, thank you for referring this zoning map amendment received March 27th, 2019 to us for review and comment. The zoning map amendment was referred to our office to review for consistency with the goals and policies of the Co Connecticut Coastal Management Act, CCMA, Connecticut General Statutes, Section 22A-90 through 22A-112 inclusive. Zoning map amendment. The applicant seeks to rezone a waterfront MC80 Marine Commercial Zone parcel of land to NDD, Neighborhood Development District, to allow for the future building of commercial and residential uses on waterfront land in an AE11 flood zone. The site is currently an 11.2 acre boat yard with 120 slips in the water and an on-site restaurant. The property owner intends to consolidate marina services at its knowing location. Diminishment of a water dependent use on a waterfront site. The goals and policies of the Connecticut Coastal Management Act state that water dependent uses, which can only be located in or near the water, be given high priority and preference on waterfront sites, specifically Section 22A-92-3 of the General Statute states, to give high priority and preference to uses and facilities which are dependent upon proximity to the water or the shorelands immediately adjacent to marine and tidal waters. The MC-80 zone in Stonington is a marine commercial zone which allows water dependent uses. We believe that the subject waterfront site is appropriately zoned MC-80 since water dependent uses can only be located on waterfront sites such as the subject site and that hotels, restaurants and residences which would be facilitated by the zoning map change can be located on upland sites elsewhere in the town and do not require access to the water. Waterfront sites are scarce and very little waterfront land in Stonington is zoned MC-80 for water dependent uses. Locating non-water dependent land uses on a waterfront site would therefore constitute an adverse impact as defined by section 22A-9317 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Adverse impacts on future water dependent development opportunities and adverse impacts on future water dependent development activities include but are not limited to A, locating a non-water dependent use on a site that is one, physically suited for a water dependent use for which there is, there is a reasonably reasonable demand, or two, has been identified for a water dependent use in the plan of conservation in the, of the municipality of the zoning regulations. B, replacement of a water dependent use with a non-water dependent use, and C, siting of a non-water dependent use which would substantially reduce or inhibit existing public access to marine or tidal waters. Given the long history of the site as an active boatyard, the site is physically suited for a water dependent use. Marine services are identified in section 10.4 of the Stonington Plan of Conservation and Development as economic drivers worthy of being enhanced and protected. This proposal allows a working boatyard to be supplanted by residential and commercial non-water dependent land uses. We believe that waterfront parcels are most su suitably used for water dependent uses as well as much needed support services including accessory parking, administrative office space, bait and tackle stores, boat construction, boat sales, boat maintenance and repair, dry boat storage, storage and warehousing, dive shops, seafood processing operations, etc. Without parking, administrative buildings and other support services, water dependent uses could eventually become squeezed, unable to expand in the future or operate effectively in the present. A recent viewing of Google Maps shows approximately 47 boats and some cars stored on the upland area where the applicant is proposing future residences as well as a private parking area for those residential units indicating a reasonable demand for water dependent uses. The applicant should demonstrate to the commission that the site cannot be sold to another marina operator or used for another water dependent use. FEMA flood zone. The entire site for the proposed residential and commercial development is a designated AE-11 flood zone. We are particularly concerned with siting residential uses in flood prone areas. The current structures on the site are industrial and warehouse type structures as well as a restaurant which do not house people. In the event of a storm, employees typically vacate the workplace in commercial areas. This is not the case when residences are sited on flood prone land. The Connecticut Coastal Management Act does not support the location of residential housing in flood zones which would unnecessarily place people and property in harm's way during storm flooding events. 
The zoning map amendment will allow and facilitate residential housing on the site. Specifically, the CCMA states that municipalities should manage coastal hazard areas so as to ensure that development proceeds in such a manner that hazards to life and property are minimized. By knowingly placing more people at risk by citing residences in flood prone areas, the zoning map amendment potentially increases hazards to both life and property and is inconsistent with the CCMA. We recommend that the commission not allow residential uses such as townhouses and multifamily homes in flood prone areas. These areas are best reserved for commercial industrial uses which can be vacated during storm events. Although the residential structures themselves may be elevated to meet FEMA standards and in AE flood zones, there is no dry access for residences to exit the property during a storm event, leaving future residents stranded and unable to leave their homes. The site is relatively low relative to the elevation of the base flood elevation, BFE. The elevation of the access road is less than four feet, NAVD 88, or approximately seven feet below the BFE of 11. Tidal wetlands. The proposed site plan may be illustrative at this time and subject to change, but it currently proposes to site townhouses within a few feet of tidal wetlands. Tidal wetlands are among the most biologically diverse systems in the world and they serve a myriad of valuable services, including flood storage. The commission and the applicant should be aware that tidal wetlands do not do tend to migrate over time and are therefore not fixed in place. Siding, siding townhouses so close to tidal wetlands may potentially create a situation in the future where the property owners will propose flood and erosion control walls to protect the townhouses from sea level rise and tidal wetlands migration. We strongly advise against building townhouses in the flood zone in close proximity to tidal wetlands. Plan of Conservation and Development Conflicts. Local Plan of Conservation and Development, POCD, is essentially a master plan for the community. It guides future development and zone changes must conform to the POCD. The Stonington POCD illustrates a future land use map of Mystic on page 129 and designates this particularly waterfront site as marine commercial. The proposed zoning map amendment to rezone this marine commercial site to neighborhood development district is therefore not in conformance with the town's POCD and also would seem to conflict with a number of provisions in the POCD text as follows. Section 3.2.5 states that this, the town will provide water dependent uses in coastal areas. Waterfront sites suitable for water dependent uses are scarce and this rezoning removes another waterfront site from eligibility for hosting a viable water dependent use. This zoning map amendment severely diminishes water dependent use on a waterfront site. Section 3.3.2 states that the town will discourage new public infrastructure or development in flood prone areas. The site is currently occupied by a boat yard which is an appropriate use on a waterfront site in a flood zone. By amending the zoning map and facilitating residential development on the site including townhouses and a hotel, the zoning map amendment would allow residential development in a floodplain area. Section 3.2.5 states that the town will plan to adopt plan to adapt to the projected rise in sea level. However, this proposal to site residential uses on the waterfront at elevation 4, when the base flood elevation is 11, will place more people and property in harm's way. While retreating is one response to the projected sea level rise, siting non-residential uses on flood prone sites is another response to sea level rise. However, placing new residential uses in the flood prone areas is not adapting to sea level rise. Section Section 3.3.7 states that the town will restrict living facilities, hotels, elderly housing, and schools which have the potential to increase exposure of vulnerable populations in coastal flood hazard areas. The zoning map amendment will allow and facilitate the construction of a hotel in a coastal flood hazard area. Hotel guests are typically not from the area, they, nor are they familiar with the area, and in flooding events they would have to be evacuated. Section 10.3 states that the town should include planning for retention of existing businesses as part of its economic development efforts. The Connecticut Coastal Management Act recognizes waterfront sites as the only sites which can accommodate water dependent uses in a community. By replacing a boatyard with residential uses, future water dependent uses will most likely not occur at this site in the future. Section 7, Section 10.4 states that the town should develop a comprehensive economic development plan that focuses on enhancing economic drivers 
including but not limited to tourism, high value manufacturing, research and development, and marine services. Marine services are a recognized economic driver in the community, and these services cannot be located at anywhere but on a waterfront site. General public access. Including general public access on a waterfront site is one way to include a water dependent use on a waterfront site that is redeveloped with non-water dependent uses. On this 11.2 acre site, however, the limited general public access proposed is not commensurate with the loss of an existing boatyard. Future flood and erosion control walls. If the zoning map amendment is approved and residential non-water dependent uses are sited on the upland, the site will not be eligible for approval of future flood and erosion control structures to protect those residential structures in the event of sea level rise. Structures must be pre-1995 to be eligible for a flood or erosion control wall. As the Commission is aware, any application for, for a flood and erosion control structure must be referred to Connecticut DEP under Section 22A-109D of the Connecticut General Statutes. Conclusion. The site is entirely in the AE-11 flood zone, and proposing to locate residences in the flood zone exposes more people and property to risk. The Connecticut Coastal Management Act discourages locating residences in flood zones. We believe this waterfront site is appropriately zoned MC-80 for a boat yard use. Rezoning the waterfront site to NDD will adversely impact the upland water dependent use and allow residences in a flood zone. We respectfully urge that the commission not rezone this waterfront MC-80 par zoned parcel for residential use and carefully consider the potential adverse impacts to the water dependent use of a site that is highly suitable for water dependent uses. Water dependent uses can only be located on the waterfront, while townhouses and other residential uses can be located on the upland anywhere in the community. Once this waterfront site is rezoned to NDD to allow for residential use, Stonington loses a rare and valuable site for water dependent uses, possibly forever. The rezoning will have adverse impacts on present and future water dependent uses and opportunities. While we recognize that the site development plan may change, this proposal diminishes a viable marina with upland support services by placing the majority of the upland marine support services with non-water dependent uses, including a second on-site restaurant, a hotel, and residential units in on-site parking to support the non-water dependent uses. While a marina is included, it is no longer the primary land use on this 11.2 acre parcel. A part of one new building on the upland will support the marina and remaining boat slips. A limited waterfront public access walkway has been included to replace the loss of the upland water dependent use. While the applicant may be consolidating its marina operations at its no-ink location, such a move does not offset the loss of a water dependent use at this site. Should the Commission decide that rezoning is appropriate, when reviewing future development proposals, the Commission should ensure that adequate water dependent uses are included and adverse impacts to the existing water dependent use are, adequ are adequately mitigated. We hope that these comments are helpful to the Commission. We request that these be read into the record for the public hearing application. Uh, if we can be of further assistance, please feel free to contact me at his number. Thank you, Keith. Let's try to keep the applause down. It doesn't influence us at all. <clears throat> right now, rather than going to ask the commission, the uh, applicant questions, we're going to ask the people who signed up to speak in favor, give them a chance to talk, and then we will go back to the applicant. Uh, I'm going to call 10 names, and if you'd line up and speak, uh, at either podium and left or right aisle, uh, Judy Kaiser, yeah. Caracasa, um, Jerry Carinado, 62 Washington Street, Al Valenti, Peggy Roberts, Jim Lathrop, Dave Hammond, David Labatty, Chris Regan, Joyce Resnikoff, and Tom Todd Brady. They can please come forward to speak now. Yes. No, we do it. We do it all. We 
No, we, we like to hear, we, this is the way we've always done it. Has all those in favor, and then all those against, and we're gonna get through it. It's, it's, if we get, well, I know we're gonna be done at 11 o'clock tonight, all right? It will be done, we have, I just called 10, there are, I'll tell you exactly, there are 32 in favor, 45 against. That's the way it is, okay? We've got the first 10 of the 32. Uh, my name is Jerry Candelaro. I live, live at 62 Washington Street. I actually have two properties on Washington Street, and um, I just want to say I support the, the project. Um, I love downtown Mystic. I mean, the reason I moved here is because I love being able to walk down to downtown, walk by all the water, and this just enhances it. So I, I welcome the project. Thank you. Listen. We're trying to have a meeting, and I'm, if any questions to the chair, you'll have your turn to speak. Well, come next week, come next meeting. We're trying to run this without everyone interrupting, please. Yes. Well, we come every time, don't we? <laughs> I'm Dave Hammond, Greenhaven Road in Pawkatuck. I'm also the chair of the Economic Development Commission. Um, the Economic Development Commission uh, hosted the applicant at one of our meetings, and we unanimous, unanimously, unanimously voted our support, and a letter of support is included in the, in the meeting report that PCC has, and I encourage everyone to review that. So the EDC, advocates for responsible, quality, commercial, and residential development that contributes to the grandless growth and local economic development. That's our role. And some of the comments that we're, we're hearing right now, as town expenses continue to rise and state revenue sharing back to towns in Connecticut continues to shrink, growing the grand list has become an imperative. In addition, we hear from residents at budget meetings and at uh, other public meetings that infrastructure improvements such as sidewalks are important. Well, to pay for these budget challenges and to fund these improvements, quality development needs to happen. So the, uh, the PCC, the EDC urges the PCC and the town residents to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peggy Roberts. I'm the president of the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. I represent about 700 members. I'm also a resident of Stonington, and we support the project. With me tonight are about six or seven members of our board of directors who came to express their support. In addition, those, uh, several of those who could not be here submitted letters of support. We also have several members of our Chairman's Advisory Council in attendance, and I believe they're almost all in support, if not every one of them in support. We support this, this measure for many, many reasons, but one, probably the most important to us, is that it will stimulate tourism, increase consumer spending in our area in Mystic, and that's one of the things that we are about as a chamber. We are here to support businesses and to stimulate business to the extent we can. We believe the tax revenue will be very valuable. We also look forward to seeing some much needed green space, open space, open to the public. We do recognize that not everyone is completely happy with the project and that there are some things to be ironed out. But we do believe that the process will address those things and that we can be happy with, with this project as we go forward. I think it's a great project and we urge you to support it. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Al Valente, 60 Haley Road in Mystic. And uh, I am the chairman of the board of the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to piggyback off of what Peggy had just said 
I'll try not to be redundant. Um, in addition to tourism, which is our primary mission of the chamber, we're also very concerned about economic development uh, and make sure that that development is sustainable in the years to come. We feel that this project does enhance that type of um, economic development. The number put out today was that the residents at Smilers Wharf would uplift uh, the local economy, meaning the immediate impact zone around the village of downtown Mystic, by about $300,000. I would submit that as more of an impact than that because of the multiplier effect. We have store owners, restaurant owners, hotel owners, and when they get paid by this uplift, they pass that money on to other businesses. So that's a good thing. Of particular note is the uh, new boat basin. Uh, I'm a boater, and I can assure you that the best kind of tourism dollars you want to get are from these mega yachts. Uh, these are high net worth individuals, and they spend, and they spend large. The beauty of it also is that when they arrive and they leave, they're going by water, not going over the roads and uh, clogging up our streets and what have you. Uh, Mystic is highly desirable by these yachts uh, to be on that circuit from Manhattan, Mystic, uh, Newport, Nantucket, and so on and so forth, but we don't have that many berths, and if we get that boat, Based and built, that'll add to that. Thank and you. What's, what's, what's interesting to this, one last point, is that um, those yachts are not only the spenders, but they're also a part of the sites that they enhance in our area. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Chris Regan, 20 Finley Way, Stonington, Connecticut. Used to be on your commission um, previous years, um, associated with Omistic Village. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm happy this project is coming to, um, to Mystic, because I think as a lifelong resident that l lives here, um, I think it's a great change for the improvement of tourism. Tourism is big business in the state of Connecticut. They don't want to believe it, but we are the driving force, and we should be considered lucky that we have Mystic thriving for tourism. And you know what? Being here as a lifelong resident in 73, my mother and my uncle developed Olmistic Village. And at that time, tourism was not the driving force. It is now. And if, you've already, if, you're, if you're a resident in that area, you already knew it was tourism. And there's people going to be around. We know it's three or four months during the summer, and everybody basically makes accommodations to do other things that they don't want to be around the crowds. But this for the uh, boating, boating is tourism. Just like Al just said, it brings people here to spend money. Around the country, commercial real estate's not doing great. But you know what? Mystic's thriving. And we should be happy about that. And I don't, I don't think this project is over the top. I think, yeah, there's some things that might have to get tweaked here and there, but overall, it's a benefit to our community. And I hope you guys think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Labby. I have a, um, a marketing and business development company in town. I've been here for over 25 years. I have three girls in the Stonington school system. Um, all have braces on their teeth, so, oh, that has nothing to do with tonight. I just thought I'd make you feel badly for me. But, um, so I'm in favor of this project. Uh, I think it's a smart project. I think it's a good project. Uh, I think it was created and run by some really good local people uh, that will develop this for us. This project for me is a chance to enhance the waterfront, it, to tear down some unappealing structures that I think detract from the landscape. And then two things, to provide growth and opportunities for those who want to work downtown today. But more importantly for me, for my kids to give them opportunities to work downtown tomorrow. Our kids don't typically come back to this area after they graduate. And I think projects like this, when, they, when they're able to see a vibrant working downtown, allow them to make choices to live there and work there. So my hope is that we don't really think about or consider what's happening today, but what will happen to them 
if Mystic doesn't remain this vibrant town of growth. So I, I appreciate your time and I hope you consider their application. Good evening, uh, Joyce Olson, Resnikoff, Old Mystic Village. All the things I was going to say, these nice people before me said it. I love it that it's not outsiders that are do developing it. They've lived here, I've known them, both families for over 40 years. I like that. I think it's very important because they know what we need and what they would like to see. So I am in favor and I hope you do make it easy for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next 10. Right, one more over here. Oh. I'll call 10 more while you're just Am I on the wrong side of the room here? Yeah. Uh, uh, Linda Cavallo. What is it? Camille. Uh, Scott and Peter Zelker, 12, 19 Jackson Avenue. John Rowe. Uh, Larry Chester. I can't read some of these. Oh, Phil Bianco, Tony Sheridan, Robert Hannon, and Tim Murray. Okay, yeah. go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Todd Brady. Um, I have a house at 17 Water Street and um, a business at 31 Water Street on the Groton side of Mystic. Uh, my office looks directly across the river at the uh, subject property. Um, and uh, I own a marina there, which is in many respects now just a recreational marina because the boat repair business simply was not economically viable. I live right in downtown Mystic. I don't know what my traffic level rating is on Water Street, but I suspect it's pretty low. And I love this town, and I love the congestion, and I love the people, and I love the tourists. <laughs> you know, I know some people who say that in the summertime, they don't go to downtown Mystic because they can't drive through Mystic easily or whatever. A lot of them live in the neighborhood. We can walk to downtown, and we can take advantage of the fact that the services and the, um, the excitement that, that the town is now seeing, and I've seen tremendous growth on, growth on Water Street of restaurants and that kind of thing, and I think that the point that David Labby made about attracting younger people to this area is very, very important. I've had young people come into my office, some of them moved up here uh, from New York City. They have children, and they decide they don't, they don't want to live, uh, raise them in the city, and some of them, they say, what you need up here is you need an exciting town. You need things to do. You need things to attract people. And if I look at this group here, and not to disparage anyone, but you know, there's sort of a sea of gray hair. My daughters tell me I'm one of them too, okay? But I think we have to look to the future. And to look to the future, we have to continue to attract uh, young people. And that's an important goal that I think this project uh, will further. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Camilio, and I live in Pocketuck, and I've lived in Stonington and Pocketuck for 35 years, maybe 36 or seven, I'm not sure. Um, and also, in the interest of full disclosure, I am the Stonington tax collector, but I am not here to talk about increasing the grand list or any of that stuff. I'm here as an interested taxpayer. I'm a person who is nearing retirement who no longer wants to maintain a home. Uh, I want an apartment. And there's a shortage of apartments for people like me and for young professionals. My daughter uh, is 28 and she works at General Dynamics. And she makes a pretty good salary. She can afford an apartment. Um, I'll admit, I am concerned about parking and I'm concerned about sewage. But I think those problems are all being worked on. Um, but does the town of Stonington want to keep retirees here? I hope they do because I want to stay here. And do you want to keep young professionals in the area? I hope so too because General Dynamics is hiring tons of people and we need apartments. Um, so if you want to keep us, build places like uh, this development or David Latizori's um, Perkins Farm. I personally don't know if we could afford an apartment there. I hope I could, but um, I do know that lots of people in this area can, and there's a need. 
I have a lot of friends who also don't want to own a house anymore. We want to downsize. Two years ago, my husband lived and worked in Washington, D.C. When he walked out, he lived in the, the southeast part of D.C. His apartment had a workout facility, a dog park, a common area, a barbecue area, and all for $1,400 a month. He could walk out his front door, go to Washington National Stadium, and um, had access to bike paths along the river, walking paths, skateboard parks, not that he skateboards, thank God. Um, and we don't have anything like that here so far. So I'm hoping we do soon. Thank I you. support this project. Thank you. Thank you, my name is John Rowe. I live in Stonington Borough. Uh, I can't possibly uh, say anything better than has already been said tonight. I think it's absolutely a wonderful idea. As a businessman, I'm a favor, uh, I, I favor economic development, but I favor it when it's very carefully considered. And I'm pretty sure I've lived here 20 years. This is one of the finest projects I've ever seen. I think we have to be careful. I think we have to discuss it. I think we have to sp spend our time and make sure that we get it right. But bottom line, I think it's wonderful. And I think uh, the developer and the team that presented tonight deserve a hand. Thank you. My name is Larry Chesler. I live in New London. I used to live on Jackson Avenue. Uh, I keep a boat at Seaport Marine. I like the area. I think this is, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of things that go on the river. I really support this project. I hope the commission uh, considers the bene real benefits to this. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing? Peter Zelkin from 19 Jackson Avenue in Mystic. I want to say, uh, looking at this project for the next, you know, 100 years forward, you got to look at transportation and where it's going. And, you might want to think about, you know, people driving one car per person. I don't know if that's the way this uh, world is going with transportation. I think ride shares and things like that are becoming, you know, ubiquitous. And uh, one of the things you might want to consider, look, you know, as parking spaces become obsolete, possibly moving forward. Uh, I support this project. Peter, can we get your last name, please? Zelkin, Z-E-L-K-E-N. Good evening. My name is Peter Healy. I'm at One Pawsick Point. I've been a resident in this area for about 25 years. Um, I think this project has been very well thought out. I think the, uh, the professional resources that I demonstrated uh, and answered all uh, of my questions, I, and I fully support the project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Phil Biondo. I live at 183 Cove Road. I'm here and speaking in favor of the project. I see it as a project that's been well laid out. I like the architecture. I believe it pro provides public amenities, more boardwalks. My son and I oftentimes spend a lot of time walking downtown. I see this as a, an extension of that. So I think it's been well laid out having the public park there, in addition to public park, I think is nice. And one thing we d I didn't notice until coming tonight is seeing kind of the shape of the buildings and how cut off the existing warehousing, the, the, the spaces are to the public. I see this as an ex, this new project, an extension of bringing the downtown into Smilers Wharf. So I see it as a positive, well thought out project and I support its passage. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Hannon. I live at 17 Washington Street. I actually live across the street from the proposed project. I support it for the following reasons. Number one, it's going to enhance the use of the Mystic Waterfront by keeping a marine operation in place while also adding 1,000 feet of boardwalk, which will allow people like myself and my family to walk along most of Mystic River south of the drawbridge. Number two, it'll provide jobs both in hospitality and the construction sectors, which we could all use for our kids, for our families, and for ourselves. Number three, it'll, and you've heard this from people that have been spoken before me, it'll bolster the retail sector. It'll help the businesses that have opened up in the, in the Main Street area. 
Number four, it's gonna provide needed residential and boutique hotel accommodations in downtown Mystic with a self-contained area where they supply all the parking, unlike the other side of the river in Groton. More people will stay, work, and play without getting into their automobiles. Number five, it'll help alleviate the flooding on the site since it'll be improving the aging seawall. Number six, it's gonna enhance the property, the grand list for the town, which will help offset the state cutbacks and keep my property taxes hopefully down or stable. In conclusion, I hope the, con the commission supports the efforts of the private developers who are willing to invest over $50 million of their own money into this project, which will benefit our community. It's easy for people to find fault with, our, with this project and to just say no to any change. Change is not an option, folks. That project will get, some project will get developed there. And this one, I think, fits in with the character of Mystic. Mm -hmm. I'm asking the commission to support these private developers and to approve the requested voting change, the uh, zoning change. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Murray. I live at 12 Geyser Street in Mystic. Um, I just wanted to say I'm very much in support of this project. And, you know, as it sits right now, this property is not utilized to the highest and best th that it could be. Um, it's been in front of a few commissions. It's been in front of, and it's, gonna, it's been in front of a few um, um, economic development commission. And um, who else was it in front of? Jim, forget. Anyway, but they, and they all approved it. So I think highest and best is this project. And uh, I hope you go for the uh, zoning change. To, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tony Sheridan. I'm president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut, and I'm here in support of this project. I'm here, we have approximately 1,600 companies that belong to the chamber, many of them in the tourism business, and naturally many of them surrounding the Mystic area. So tourism, as we all know, is a major core of, of our economic community. Yes, we greatly appreciate the electric boats and the Pfizer and the other industries in the area, but tourism has been our steady economic core. And that's really important. When other parts of the economy goes up and down, the Mystic region is an attractive place to visit. I dare say that we want Mystic to continue to be the tourism capital of Connecticut. We should lend, if we do, we should lend our support to this project. All tourism venues and attractions to remain viable must continue to evolve with consumer demands. This proposal will create jobs, increase local tax revenue, complement the region's existing attractions, strengthen the region's offerings, and in doing so, make sure we continue to secure Mystic as a must-visit area of the state of Connecticut. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Maureen. 7710 Nano Doink Road, uh, Bob Siglia, Jerry Canado, Canado, um, Summon Johnson and 60 Williams, Willow Street, Chris Rickson, Blunt White, um, Eric Courier, Jeffrey L Little. Little? 16 Diving Street, Stephen Cohn, Peter Hella, Helly, Helly, and David Lattazari. Good evening. I am Maureen Griffin Balsba. Um, I live at 710 No Ink Road in Mystic. I'm an interior architect and designer, a female owned business in Connecticut. Um, I strongly support this project. Um, I believe there really is a need for people who want to live in a downtown environment, as that one woman said, um, where they can walk to the local restaurants and shops. The positive economic trends that I see in my line of work is that people are opting for a live, work, play sort of environment with access to public transportation. Smilers Wharf would offer exactly that. Um, as it stands now, driving down Cottrell Street, seeing what looks to be like a condemnable line of buildings is nothing to be proud of. 
I would like to think that when new boaters come through the train bridge, we would like them to see something as Myler's Wharf is being proposed and not as it is at the moment. Um, as residents, I think we would want to be proud of something like that, as long with, and also the thousands of train passengers that go along that train bridge every day, and they look and they see what we have to offer and perhaps put it in their head that, oh, maybe I'd like to go visit there or perhaps a beautiful place to live. Connecticut shoreline is aging. We are losing our tax base to our neighboring states, especially Massachusetts. It is facing a business exodus crisis. Stonington home sales are down by 40% from 2018. That should concern all of us. I believe that Smiler's Wharf project will entice people to buy real estate here in Mystic. I feel strongly that the state and our community needs to think creatively about how to attract people to stay and start their businesses here in our community. I'm very much in favor of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Rob Marsilia, 50 Amy Drive, Pocketuck. Um, so I too am in favor of this project and I'll uh, explain a few reasons why. So uh, over the last year, I visited um, four other major cities in the United States, uh, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. And in each of those cities, I saw uh, the downtown area experiencing resurgence um, with some significant new construction that was feeding that vibrant area that I visited. And I'm not trying to equate Mystic to a major city in the country. What I am trying to bring is that the new construction that happens that leads to the resurgence is a benefit to the area that, that gets that new construction. So I see this as a real benefit to Mystic. Um, someone asked me at the break why I'm in favor of this, and, and one of the things that I see coming out of this project is the step change that could happen as, that would benefit the entire Mystic area and truthfully the town of Stonington. Um, so next, uh, the NDD. So uh, I sat on this commission for a number of years. Um, at one point I was chairman of this commission. Um, so I appreciate the work that you folks are doing in serving the town uh, in the way that you're doing. Uh, it's commendable, and I know how much time it takes. Um, when I was on this commission, um, I was part of the team that negotiated and ultimately approved the NDD. Um, and while we were debating approval of this regulation, one of our goals was to enable appropriate development and to reduce or eliminate blight. And I think that's exactly what this presentation brings to you tonight, is appropriate development. And I think that's something where you'll have to work with the developer to find that balance of appropriate. But nonetheless, this is a project that should be built and I hope will be built. And I hope that you'll get that appropriate development and reduce and eliminate blight. So I'll go to that next. Um, the views that will be developed um, by this project bring depth from the street rather than those white walls of old buildings and tired buildings that are there now. So I think that is part of the resurgence that could happen um, on, the, on the land, on the site. As far as traffic goes, simply put, let the Stonington Police Department and the Police Commission work on the traffic patterns, the one-way street designs, and on-street parking to make that part of this project. Um, as far as the demographic goes, I'm currently chairman of the K-12 Building Committee. And what I'll share with you is that the statistics that we heard tonight, I know I'm getting long, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the statistics that we heard tonight are accurate to what we built for the schools. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, we added a couple of extra classrooms to each of those buildings to ensure that there was buffer in case of, a, of, a, of an uptick in, um, in uh, class enrollment. Um, parking, I think the, the parking part needs a little bit of clarity. 
parking at the Packer building didn't seem obvious, so that needs a little bit of work. Okay. I hope you'll be able to come through that. Okay. Um, lastly, I'll end with this. 15 years ago when I brought my kids to the playground across the street, I looked at these white buildings and I thought, there's got to be something better we can do with this property. And they're here now with that plan. So I suggest and strongly hope that you'll approve this plan before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is uh, Chris Rickson. Uh, I lived in the Stonington Mystic area for 20 years uh, and currently uh, work in Mystic. Um, I just, first of all, I wanted to correct Attorney Sweeney. Um, Abby is a third generation, third generation Holstein. Her grandfather, Mel, uh, the family still owns the Packer building. He bought that. So third generation Holstein investing in our community. Um, secondly, I heard words that we talked about 20 years ago. And the words were fabric. Fabric. The neighborhood development district wasn't, hey, there's the house across the street. We'll do 11 acres of those. If we wanted to do that, we'll just leave the same old block zoning in place. No, we had creativity. We had Jason. And we had the neighborhood development district. And what that is going to allow us to do is turn Mystic back into Mystic. In order to change, in order to keep the state of the same, you gotta change. Without this tool, we don't change. We keep building the same old beep. Three, Keith, nice job. How did you do that? I couldn't read that letter. I couldn't write that letter. I don't know who the hell wrote that letter. But right now, if I've got buildings two feet above the floodplain, I can't be worried about global warming. I can't, because the neighbors across the street, they're at 13 feet below me. They're the ones that should be worrying about it. These guys are solving the problem. And they're talking about solving the problem for the neighborhood with a bulkhead. I'm getting a little excited, thank you. Finally, I think what's important here tonight is to think about what we are talking about. We are talking about taking a derelict site and turning it into the cornerstone of a run that begins with the Mystic Seaport you walk all the way down the sidewalks, across a nice public park, down into this new development, and you are able to go from one great attraction to another. This is a no-brainer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening. It's Blunt White from Collins Road. And I wanted to talk to you about marina businesses and alternatives. And the, the marina business of winter storage now, winter storage of boats in downtown Mystic is a mismatch. And that's, that's the proposition which is, is before us. Try something different. And I can tell you what's happening in the marina business, and I urge you to do your due diligence after, is a lot of the, the good marinas are moving their winter storage off premises. And they're putting it back country where they can do work during the winter on the boats and charge more and pay their employees more and generate more revenue, pay more taxes. And this is an opportunity to get the winter storage out of downtown Mystic and get something in there that fits. And, and so for that, for that reason, I would urge you to approve the, the, the master plan. Now, the other angle of this is about the, the, the money angle. And so there's an incremental that was talked about in the fiscal in impact study of $388,000 top line gross extra tax revenue coming in before any charges for school aged children. And that 380,000, I can tell you that the Board of Finance approved a budget increase of, of close to $3 million this year. And so that has to be paid for somehow. And so we have to generate more revenue. And so this is an opportunity for a step forward. And so I support the, uh, ma new, the master plan. Thank you. Good evening, Steve Cohen, 4 Fallon Road, Pawkatuck. Uh, I think it was stated tonight, this is the beginning of a beginning. So <clears throat> what we saw tonight is not necessarily the end product, but I would encourage you to look at some key points. One is increased access to the waterfront. This is really important. The second is restoration of the beauty of the coastline. This is really important. And the uh, fact that this takes into account 
the importance of building coastal resiliency is really important. This is a good project from all sorts of points of view. It's essential for the economic vibrancy of our community, and that point has been made by others tonight. This is a good project, and I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we don't know this guy. <laughs> My name is David Ladazuri, and I'm the owner and developer of the Perkins Farm campus. Probably should introduce myself because I'm sure these guys are tired of me. <laughs> I have been before them probably, I think we should have a standing reservation every six months on the dot. I'm just going to come here and talk about something. I just wanted to provide a little bit of perspective because these projects are incredibly complicated. They take some of the best minds in our region and they put them to work. And there's always multiple ways to look at something. And before you even get to this stage, there are so many hoops and hurdles and ladders you have to climb. So many commissions that you have to go for. And this is just the first stop. I feel for these guys, because I went through it for three years, and I look around, and I'm actually the only person here with no gray hair. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> but I just will say this, is that all these projects are built on conservative upon conservative upon conservative guidelines. These are just kind of metrics that we use to kind of conform and build these projects. And this is the first step. It shouldn't be the last step. It's the first step to kind of fine tune it and massage it to meet the needs of the community. And I think this community needs this project. I'm building one of the largest projects in this town. And the keystone of my project is a state-of-the-art hospital. And one of the reasons how I got it is I was at Red 36 with the head of this hospital group. And I said, wouldn't it be nice to have your doctors living in this community? And he said, you know what, Dave? It's so incredibly difficult for us to attract the top talent to this neck of the woods because we're trying to get them from the city. And they have a lot of other competing offers. Can't see. Well, we just signed on some of the top surgeons in the state, probably the country, to come to our facility. And one of the reasons is they want to live in Mystic. Now, I look at this project, and you're basically taking private land, and you're making it public because of the public component. It's looking at access from not only downtown, but also from the waterfront. And this site is really one of the gateways to Mystic. And I think what you can see from this presentation is that they've done one amazing job trying to address these concerns. So all I ask is that you give them a shot, you keep the ball going, and as my dad always said, timing in real estate is everything. And I look around and everyone's talking about the next generation. Well, I was one of those guys where people tried to recruit me all over the country to work for them. And my dad had some health issues. And I came back to Mystic. And it was one dark, cold winter. No one was around. And I think when you look at the next generation, you have to provide diversity of housing, services, and all these types of amenities that this type of development offers. So don't just think about the people in this room. Think about everyone in the community. I know you do it. You're going to do it. And uh, I applaud you on all your service. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Hello. My name is Eric Currier. And I have a small business. Sorry. Hello, my name is Eric Courier, and I have a small business called Mystic River Cruises. And I make my money with people coming up, you know, coming to see the river. I was born and raised here. I absolutely love Mystic, and I've seen it make some great changes. Uh, and I think we need some more. Most of my customers are New Yorkers, and they're constantly walking through this horrid place to get to me. And something definitely has to change without a doubt about that place. I don't know if we have all the answers, but I definitely think the public access area is, is a great answer. Uh, I do see us using less and less cars and more and more walking. I really see that. My customers see that. Um, and the other thing is that it's not stopping. New Yorkers are here. They're coming constantly. We're halfway between New York and Boston. I really feel that the walkway is the major part of this, which I really think is important and a number one um, concern to consider voting for this as a yes. Um, 
And I also want to just make a small suggestion. I do think we need to change our sidewalks, uh, especially like over to the Packer building. And also, I feel we need to open up transportation between the big chain hotels further uptown and create some sort of uh, better way to get there from here with some sort of public transportation. I'm not sure we need to address that somewhere, but I just, but I'm still in, in I think this is a good project. That's it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that signed up to speak in favor that I didn't call? All right, now we would call those in opposition. To, what? Or anybody who didn't. Oh, anyone I said who didn't sign up that would like to talk. No, okay. Well, oh. Bill Sternberg. Uh, Bill Lyman, Lyman, if I botch up your names, it's because I can't read your signatures. And Nancy Evans, Charles Wentworth, Judd Files, Susan Carpenter, Jennifer, I don't know, they're together, Ben Tamsky, and Joan Durant and Nancy. 22 Jackson. What? Na 22 Jackson Avenue Noise. Uh, okay, go right ahead. Bill Sternberg, uh, 153 Elm Street in Stonington. Um, I'm opposed to this project. I'm opposed for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the details here because I don't have a vote. You folks have the vote. All right. At the end of this entire process, there's this resolution that you have to vote on. And to vote yes on it, you have to make some findings. Right? You have to find that this project isn't going to adversely impact the neighborhood. You have to find that this project is in compliance with our own POCD and you have to find that this project is in compliance with the Connecticut Coastal Management Act. Now, you can listen to the paid, the hired hands from the applicant, because they made the case that it does comply. Or you can listen to the Department of Environmental Protection, which made the case that this thing clearly doesn't conform with the Coastal Management Act. Or you can listen to your own town engineer who has stated in your report that it's going to cause traffic problems and parking problems. Um, I'm a career civil servant. I'm paid to protect the public interest. The people who wrote the opinion from the Department of Environmental Protection are just like me. They're my peers. They're paid to protect the public interest. They gave you their unbiased opinion about what's in the public interest. Our town engineer is paid to protect the public interest. And if he says there's gonna, this is going to cause traffic problems and parking issues in the neighborhood. So it's up to you who you listen to. But my advice is you listen to the public servants who are looking out for the public interest. Bill Lyman, 579 Togwonk Road. <clears throat> it is with very mixed feelings that I have decided to speak in opposition to this plan uh, for reasons that uh, I was a member of the committee that uh, uh, years back drafted the current uh, plan of uh, conservation and development, and I am uh, currently the uh, vice chairman of the POCD implementation committee. So I recognize that there are many, many aspects of what we've heard tonight here that are, can be viewed as a positive thing in terms of the guidance of the POCD. But the POCD is a complicated document. It has many, many different guidance to it, and, and, and it's going to boil down to a lot of judgment on your part as to perhaps what is the most important. Uh, I feel one of the most important uh, guidance for enhancing the villages while protecting the character of the villages, which is something we talked about an awful lot, is encouraging village-scale development. 
my first reaction and several people that have talked to me uh, was that these buildings were too big, too tall. They don't fit. Uh, when I look around Mystic, Mystic has three and four story buildings, nothing more than four stories. So five and six story buildings just don't seem to me to fit the scale uh, of Mystic, uh, which is what uh, our POCD is encouraging. Uh, I also reacted to a 200 seat restaurant. Uh, a 200 seat was described as a 300, you know, three story 200 seat restaurant. That also just doesn't seem to me to fit the scale of uh, Mystic's many restaurants. While the POCD encourages residential development, it clearly provides guidance uh, uh, that um, increasing residential densities in coastal flood zones should be avoided. And, uh, and of course, this is what this is doing. Now, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some residential uh, addition or component would, would be acceptable, but uh, I think a uh, hotel in a large apartment building are adding a, an awful lot of, of density. Uh, the POCD guidance uh, for development in the coastal areas is again that the town should provide water dependent uses and we've heard, I won't go into that, the recent report from the DEP certainly uh, supports that. I, I too am concerned about the infrastructure issues that I don't feel have yet been improperly addressed. I know we're concerned, many people here I think are concerned with the existing traffic, the existing parking, the existing sewer situation, and, and only see that a, a project like this will add to this. So not that those things can't be worked out, but I think you need to consider them carefully as you do work this out. So my bottom line is that perhaps smaller would be better, uh, perhaps something a little different, perhaps uh, there's, I, I, think, I think many people that are in opposition to this thing would share the view that they like to see this area redeveloped, but are maybe reacting to the size of it, and, and maybe reacting that we're trying to put too many people uh, in this spot. So this floating zone is a, is a very important feature that we've added uh, that, uh, to encourage economic development, and I recognize that, but at the same time, uh, it's, uh, you as a commission have been given this group, uh, have been given the use of this tool uh, that allows you to protect the community character while you're uh, encouraging uh, you. this development. So Don't I die. think it's very important that, uh, Thank you. that you stick with that. Thank you. My name is Joan Durant, and I live at 22 Jackson Avenue. Uh, first, I just will say that the presentation was lovely. Did a good job, but I just don't think it belongs here. Uh, everyone I, oh, and one other thing, too. I hear so much talk about the derelict buildings. All the time, it's, oh, we have to do something because these buildings have been derelict for so long. Well, frankly, I believe that that was the plan all along. The marina was, the marina could have been kept up, but it wasn't. The buildings were left like that so that people will go by and they'll look at it and they'll say, gosh, look at these horrible buildings. We need to do something about it. So everyone that I have spoken to, friends and neighbors alike, are in total disbelief that this massive plan is even being considered. The more this proposal is reviewed, the more it's regarded as a total affront to the neighborhood. It does not conform to the town's plan of conservation, which states that future plans will enhance and not disturb the surrounding residential neighborhoods. I question the purpose of these regulations if, when convenient, they can just be ignored. Among those in opposition is the DEEP, which condemned the Smilus Wharf Plan, citing flood risk and violations of both state law and six different elements of the town's own plan of conservation and development. Also, Deb Jones, Assistant Director of Planning and Development in Groton, who questioned the heights and, of the proposed buildings and the increase in traffic and noise. My husband and I purchased our property in 1987, 
because of the great views of Groton and the Mystic Hillsides, the quiet neighborhood, and the cove with its abundant wildlife. I can't see you. We appreciated the fact that the marina was zoned MC80, which meant it would continue as a working marina. By granting this plan as proposed, you will in essence be taking away the value of not only my property, but those of the surrounding neighborhoods. Our views will be restricted by the tallest buildings in Mystic. Our quiet neighborhood will be filled with noise and additional traffic. The addition of a hotel, apartment event building, residential units, and off-site parking will definitely have an impact on traffic and congestion, not only in our neighborhood, but in the town as well, and that is only common sense. The proposed living seashore would destroy an existing living habitat east of the marina, affecting Time. current aquatic and area wildlife. Time. How much longer? I have one more paragraph. Here. Okay, I fine. Have just a I had said at the beginning that they're welcome to come up. We're trying to get two minutes, but you're welcome to wait a minute, please. I, I, I said in the beginning, you have two minutes, and if you didn't finish, when everyone else has spoken, you're welcome to come up and finish. I asked for no applause. I've been hearing a lot of applause tonight. So let's, we'll try to, try to get it going. Go right ahead. Well, we have a lot more to speak on your side, so I wanted to get everyone in right, before we adjourn at 11 o'clock. If I'll you want to come back next, next two weeks, we'll continue it. Go ahead. I can finish it? Okay. All right. The proposed living seashore would destroy an existing living habitat east of the marina, affecting current aquatic and area wildlife. This would ultimately transform the character of the village of Mystic on the Storrington side. Nothing replaces a natural habitat. This is the first time I have dealt with various town commissions, and I am very disappointed in their attitude. The commissions have clearly acted as agents for the developers with zero concern or even passing curiosity for how the residents feel. They simply took the word of the developers. I hope that this board, each and every one of you, will have some thought for the residents of this neighborhood who will have to live with this project. I hope the members of this commission will vote unanimously to maintain the integrity of our community. I urge them to fulfill their duty and obligation to the residents and therefore deny support Seaport Marine's application for a zone change. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Martley, 10 Jackson Avenue in Mystic. Um, the house that I live in is, I'm the fourth generation uh, a family member in the house. My grandparents, William and Magdalene, came to, from Germany to work in the velvet mills, uh, followed by my grandparents, Leo and Catherine Martley, who lived there. My parents lived in the house when, um, when they were first married, and now I live there with my spouse. It's, I came back to uh, Mystic from when I lived in New York and knew that that's where I wanted to share my life with my spouse. Um, our concerns are, because Susan couldn't be here tonight, but um, our concerns are like the, um, the traffic. Today I was, I was waiting in line for like 30 minutes and it's not even summertime. Um, another thing is adjacent to the proposed development are wetlands, which are in aid in providing environmental barriers and projection and protection of our neighborhood from storm surge. We're dangerously, we're dangerously vulnerable to flooding. Just take a look at the ponding that we already um, see when it occurs when water is being pumped out by numerous towns, uh, numerous basements. Um, oh, and as for like, pedestrians, um, and you were talking about having your employees park down at the Packer building, that street is very dangerous because there's no sidewalks on it and um, uh, you know, we have like little 
older folks being wheelchaired down to the music series in the summertime and traffic is really bad on that road and it gets flooded and I'm just concerned with all the traffic and the, the hotel traffic could um, do some damage. That's it. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Wenderoth. I uh, live in uh, Essex Street in uh, West Mystic and a property on uh, High Street. Um, yeah, I, th I think this uh, project is totally inappropriate. Um, I'm not opposed to development, <clears throat> but um, I think rezoning from marine commercial to neighborhood development is unsatisfactory. Um, I think it'll destroy adjacent properties and result in overcrowding with people, traffic, and congestion way beyond the area's ability to absorb the impact. Um, I think the project uh, will destroy a lot of what makes Mystic attractive and why many of us choose to live there. Uh, Oyard properties exist along the river as vacant parcels out of necessity for marine operations. They're not a blank canvas waiting to be exploited by developers. Um, I don't think um, the project should ever have gotten this far. I think the town should have uh, rejected it uh, right off the bat. Uh, I noticed uh, from the uh, speaking roster uh, in the previous um, canceled meeting that those in favor are a lot of uh, large developers. So naturally, they're going to be for such a project. Um, if this project does get approval, I can just see more of the same happening with any vacant parcel. It's just going to amplify the development of downtown Mystic. I love downtown Mystic. I arrived here in the 70s, and it was not necessarily a nice place. Some local guys developed the pro some properties and built it up and turned it into what it is today. And I think you can take it too far and you can really ruin it. And you know, the, the architects, I love architects. I used to work for a developer. The bottom line is they put a lot of spin on things. And to give you a good example of that, all you have to do is look at this auditorium. You can't get in and out of these seats. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of what you're looking at here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll leave you my comments. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nancy Evans. 40-year uh, resident, live in Old Mystic, town of Stonington. One of the original founders of the Mystic Whitford Brook Watershed Association, longtime environmentalist, friend of the Mystic River on most occasions, however it is in my backyard more frequently than I would like. I do not for the life of me understand why when the DEP has told you you will be putting people in harm's way. You do not seem to focus on the fact that within the last eight months, people's basements are now running 24 seven with sump pumps and we are in a drought cycle. Hard to believe when it's raining this little bit, but we don't have the great um, usual amount of water that supports our trees and our, and our, and our you know, environment. And that's because the sea level is, folks, rising. And the reason that we don't see it, it's incremental. When my friends tell me they have a house in Noank and it's coming over the, the, uh, the, the seawall, never happened before. When the rocks up on the Mystic River are no longer there, when you drive down River Road, there isn't a time when it's not wet. This is now, this is happening, it's not to be ignored, and we're not alone. 
all the towns up and down the East Coast, sorry, up and down the East Coast are dealing with this. That's why the former mayor of Charleston is doing a speaking tour on what they have done to mitigate the flood damage to Charleston, to Annapolis, to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. It's now. It's happening now. You've been told by the DEP you are putting people in danger. A better option would be to purchase this property from the owners. I'm not sympathetic, or not unsympathetic, I should say, to the fact that they have a property that they need to do something with. I'd prefer it to stay on marine basis. But to purchase it and put in flood mitigation, the, the dry wells, 50 feet deep, the backflow preventers, are putting in all the other towns, put in the commercial pumps, and put in a permeable parking lot. And I hate to say it, I, I don't want to see Mystic a parking lot, but this is what you've got. And when they tell me that Cottrell Street is only four feet above the floodplain, four feet, and, the, and the, the level is supposed to be 11, who's going to pay for that? You think those people are going to get to the hotel? How are they going to get there? It floods. It floods so badly that at night you cannot tell where you are on the way to the restaurant because you could drive right out off and you'd never know it. It's, it, I'm not kidding you. I've been there and I'm going, hmm, let me think here. Now, which place is that? So I leave you with that. You're entrusted to do the right thing for this community. And I, on kind of an aside, I really resent being told that I am not for change, for change's sake. I'm for change because you've got to think about what's real in this environment. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Um, ben Tamsky, 5 Edgemont Street, Mystic, Connecticut. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Mystic River Park Commission. And for the record, I signed up under general comments, but I'll speak now okay. since I was called. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, the Mystic Fire District is a significant property abutter of the Smarlers Wharf proposal. As the stewards of Mystic River Park, the Mystic Fire District Executive Committee has asked us, Mr. Mystic River Park Commission, to respond to the public notice of a proposed development of Seaport Marine Knowing Shipyard. As such, we reviewed this proposal at our April 10, 2019 meeting and have some considerable concerns regarding its impact on our property and the immediate neighborhood. We were very pleased to see that the Town of Stonington zoning regulations, which help guide your decisions regarding the requested zone change to Neighborhood Development District, or NDD, places substantial consideration for this specific zone change and master plan on neighborhood concerns. The following summarizes our primary concerns with this plan as proposed. We reference directly the town's documents, zoning regulations, and plan of conservation and development. Per Stonington regulations, NDD 7.21.1.1 general, we do not see where this plan is proposed can assure the MF, the Mystic Fire District, Mystic River Park Commission, that this plan's existence and future plans will enhance and not disrupt the surrounding residential neighborhood. In fact, we see assurances to the contrary. This plan, as proposed, will result in significant disruption and no enhancement to our property, the users of our property, nor to the taxpayers who support and maintain it. Per 7.21.2, Statement of Purpose, we don't see how this proposal in any way will maintain and enhance compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods. Per 7.21.2.1, 7, we also see conflicts with POCD Section 8 villages. This proposal does not provide for everyday village needs in the form of added services or benefits for our properties, the Mystic Fire District residents, or visitors to our properties. This plan does not propose Mystic village-scale residential development, nor does it encourage affordable housing options. This plan, as proposed, does not positively address parking issues. In fact, it worsens the problem. The proposal clearly states that it does not provide adequate parking on site. Per 7.21.2.2, we're particularly concerned about adequate buffers, promotion of pedestrian safety, provision for adequate parking, prevention of glare to adjacent properties from lighting on site. 
per 7.21.3.2. Any addition to the master plan must comply with the criteria of section 21.2, and any such change shall be made in such a way as to not disrupt the surrounding residential neighborhood. Additionally, we have the following concerns. Parking. Our respective parking lots on Cottrell Street next to the Scott Center and Washington Street at the Children's Playground are for our tenants, their guests, and visitors who use the playground. Our, parking, our parking spaces are already overburdened by visitors who do not meet the above criteria, causing hardship for our paying tenants. This proposal does not provide the required parking spaces on the current Seaport Marine site to be developed. 375 spaces required versus 316 spaces on site. This significant shortage of on-site parking proposed in this master plan will further exacerbate the situation. We vehemently request that Planning and Zoning Commission require that all parking assigned to this proposal be located solely and completely on the current Seaport Marine site. Ideally, they should have a designated on-site employee parking. The only enhancement we imagine this plan could provide to our properties would be to provide surplus on-site parking rather than just the minimum required spaces. This proposal does neither. Public safety. We are concerned about the added traffic in, the, in this area of Washington and Willow Streets. The roads are in poor condition and there are no sidewalks, yet there is much foot traffic, particularly children. Also on nights when there are concerts in the park, a considerable number of residents from the Apple Rehab Nursing Home traverse Washington Street in wheelchairs. This plan, as proposed, will seriously impact public safety buffer to the Children's Park. This is currently a quiet, sunny neighborhood children's playground park. If the final master plan includes the proposed 45-room hotel, then there should be a significant buffer between the hotel and the playground. Not only does this building, as proposed, detract from the quiet residential neighborhood, creating more of a Main Street environment, but by reaching a maximum height of 67 feet, this will cast a significant shadow across Washington Street and our park for periods of time every day similar to the way the main block does on West Main Street. Wear and tear on the park grounds. As proposed, this plan will result in added use and wear and tear to the Mystic River Park grounds and facilities adding to our maintenance costs. These costs are borne by the Mystic Fire District residents. Getting to the end. Public restrooms. There don't appear to be any public restrooms included in this proposal. The developer is creating public attractions yet provides no respective public accommodations. This will put an added burden on the current Mystic River Park restroom facilities, which are currently provided and maintained by Mystic River Fire District and Town of Stonington taxpayers. We suggest that additional public restrooms and a plan for their ongoing maintenance should be included in this plan. Noise, we strive to respect our neighbors' quality of life as well as that of our own residential tenants. As a marina, Seaport Marine's current primary activity is limited to typical daytime working hours exception being the Red 36 restaurant. We are concerned that the significant increase in after hours activity expected to do to the hotel, an additional restaurant, and any activities that will take place at the Marine Services Building and Plaza will infringe upon and degrade and detract, not enhance, the quality of life of our neighbors, tenants, and visitors to our property. Respectfully, Chuck Stevens, Chairman, Mr. Cover Park Commission. Thank you. Next ten. Uh, I think it's Brian who lives at nine Haley Street. Um, J Taylor, Taylor Heel, uh, Shannon Lake, Spiral Bonds, Adam, Adam or Alan Struck, Forty Four Home Street. Cynthia Warren and Stephen Habash, 19 Velvet Lane. And Kyle Makia, 20 Jackson Avenue. I'm a, it's a Bruce McMahon. Did he say Brian? I, yeah, go ahead. It's uh, Bruce. This is uh, Bruce McMahon. I live on Haley Street. And my major concern is um, the uh, ignoring the uh, DEEP 
recommendations. Um, I'm really concerned about that. I started a group here called Seacrest, Southeastern Connecticut River Estuary Stewardship. And I have to tell you that there are, are coves here in this area uh, have to be the cleanest, the help, healthiest rather, uh, coves in the state of Connecticut. So this town is the jewel of uh, the EPA in terms of that. It's my opinion and I've, I've heard it from them also. So to ignore them it, I think is a mistake. The other problem you have is something no one wants to talk about and that's sewage. It did get mentioned once. The mystic plant is at 80 percent or over. <clears throat> you want to be no higher than 80 percent that gives you a buffer zone. Now there's a two million dollar bond which I totally agree with. That's going to supply two pumps two brand new pumps to ship the excess from Mystic to the borough plant. Also in the two million bond is a uh, upgrade of the uh, borough uh, facility. Now uh, with the development of that hotel, which can be seen from the turnpike, that this is huge. And I heard another hotel and then the medical building uh, there's nowhere else for the sewage to go except uh, the borough. Now that's a small plant. So I'm saying that th one of the things you might want to consider is that this could be a problem if they're half in, if you allow this and they're half in development and we, we have no more room. Well, they, they're going to say, that's your problem. You gave us permission. And uh, then we have to build uh, either another sewage treat treatment plant or put an addition. The, we will not be able to build one, I believe, in the borough um, or an addition there. That's fenced in for a reason. So, uh, and that's uh, the borough, I mean, the uh, sewage treatment plant is not cheap. Now, sometimes you have to dig up the roads for extra pipes. So that's going to be paid for by the uh, Stonington taxpayer. And if this is the case, I'm saying, it's, it's, I think it's highly probable, and then once again, the taxpayer uh, pays for someone to get, well, mega bucks. I'm not saying the whole, the whole uh, program is bad, but uh, uh, the hotel and, and the houses and destroying the, uh, the environment on the uh, east side, that little cove. I see all kinds of animals there all the time, and, there, and that's going to be gone, including the trees, where the uh, night heron nests, gorgeous bird only seen at dusk or early morning because it's a night heron. Thank you very much. <laughs> I guess I can go. Uh, my name's Taylor Heal. I live on 9 Jackson Ave. Um, I've been there for 10 years. Um, I was going to talk about some of the things in the NDD, and uh, those have already been said in opposition, uh, of which I agree with a lot of them. Um, I know that some of the fours and the people that are in, in favor of the proposition, a lot of it was based on economic advantages to their businesses, and I get that. Um, my background is a Babson College grad, economics, entrepreneurial studies. I dealt with small town restaurant business, and I now deal with large international and uh, national uh, financial software. So I understand the economic benefit that is, is of potential here, but we're not just talking about economic, um, economic benefit. We're also talking about neighborhoods, surrounding neighborhoods, traffic patterns, safety for kids. Uh, I have a nine-year-old son who, when we wait on Jackson Ave and Washington Street right now today without the traffic that's potentially gonna come through there, I watch cars blow that stop sign every day. There's no sidewalks. On Jackson Ave, if you have cars parked on both sides of the street, it's a one-way street at that point. It, it's literally not passable. So there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of downsides that I see to that. I don't see development on that plot as, as a downside in its entirety. I just think that what's proposed right now, I heard a lot of talk of minimizing the impact, but what I see is minimizing with maximizing what's available to be put there. 
it's not minimizing and let's, let's not maximize what can be put on that lot. It's let's minimize, but let's put as much there as we can. And that's kind of what it was proposed and how it came across to me today. Um, one of the other things that was talked about that I wanted to do just, one of my reasons for, for opposition is tourism today that we get is drawn to Mystic because of the quaint village, the town that we have. And if we continue to expand, you know, the question becomes when is enough enough and at what point does tourism no longer get drawn there because we've lost that sense of what Mystic is made up of today. Um, those are the reasons that right now I'm opposing this as it stands. Um, we heard about compatibility, but compatibility is also defined as a state in which things are able to exist or occur together without problems or conflict. And clearly there are problems and conflict with what is being proposed today. Um, so those, those are some of the reasons I oppose this today. Thank you for your time. Um, my name's Steve Hobake. I live in Mystic. I oppose this uh, for the following reasons. I believe it's going to increase congestion of cars. It has inadequate parking. I did a, a rough calculation for the 318 cars doing two trips down 27 and I came up with roughly a mile and a half to a mile and three quarters of uh, additional uh, cars going down the road. So um, I also feel that uh, when we're proposing neighborhood development districts, the neighborhoods adjacent to these developments should buy into it. And that's clearly not the case here. And uh, I also feel the buildings are too large and um, I, I think the DEP had uh, uh, an excellent point in regard to storm surges. If we miss a direct hit from hurricanes for many years, but I would hate to think of being directly hit by a hurricane and having a lot of people on this site. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shauna Lake. I'm a 20-year resident of Stonington and a recent resident, recently moved to 15 Washington Street. Um, I have the unique privilege of living there and then walking down Washington Street and working um, in the uh, Mystic Park buildings. So every single day I walk down that street that um, it's not currently safe and so it's hard to understand how this would make it better. I think the um, traffic plan through all the confusing language ultimately says there is increased traffic on Washington Street in both directions and also on Willow Street. Um, so the con commission needs to consider the impact of the traffic on the neighborhood, I think. Um, I think what the Mystic Fire District summarized most of the points I was going to make about how there seems to be um, c conflict with the NDD regs for not disrupting but enhancing the neighborhood. And so we're talking about like the core neighborhood, obviously, of like Washington and um, Willow and Jackson and many of the neighbors who've spoken because it's hard for us to imagine how it will be enhanced. Um, and then finally, I just so I don't want to reiterate all the ways that they said it seems to conflict with the NDD, but I reinforce that, um, as well as the parts of the POCD that have been mentioned. Um, finally, I also have another unique perspective in the sense that I've actually run as a project manager, bulkhead construction projects, dredging projects um, in industrial settings. And I understand that there'll be um, increased coastal resiliency for that footprint because they're going to fix the bulkhead that they've left in disrepair to fall into the river and they're going to um, maintain the uh, wetlands that are already there but don't be misled to think that it provides any coastal resiliency to any other part of the town because it's not increasing the height of any flood protection so just to make sure when we talk coastal resiliency that they're it's specifically their footprint there it's not really helping the town it's just helping that area flood from the riverside Oh, and the last thing I wanted to say was, I think it's inappropriate to compare the height of the buildings along Route 1 um, and East Main Street to uh, Washington Street and Cottrell Street, because that really isn't part of the nature of the village down there. Um, and so it's just going to feel like a 
another main street down there with the height of the buildings right along Washington. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cynthia Warren. I live on High Street and missed it. When I heard about Smiler's Wharf, I asked myself, who's smiling? Mm -hmm. Smiler's Wharf is going to degrade the character of the town and the quality of life of its residents, especially those of us whose memories of Mystic are long and deep. I come from a family that goes back five generations here, more than 125 years of continuous residence and contribution. My great-grandfather Moses Craig came over on a boat from Scotland. He settled here and had a blacksmith shop on a dock on Water Street across from the Daniel Packer Inn. Two of his sons, William and Charles Craig, became builders of houses here, not sea captains' houses, but modest cape houses for working class people to raise a family. <clears throat> Their houses can be found on both sides of Mystic. Charles Craig's house on 8 Godfrey Street bears a historic plaque. My mother was born in the house at 44 Church Street on the Stonington side, and she died in her own grammar school, now Academy Point Assisted Living, on the Groton side. <clears throat> My grandmother died in the house at 21 Godfrey Street, a house my grandfather built. Four generations of Craigs are buried on both sides of Mystic. When I was a kid, my extended family lived on both sides of the river, but all of us only a brief walk from downtown Mystic where we could buy anything we needed. We all said we were from Mystic, not Stonington or Groton. My grandmother worked in the velvet mill, my mother's cousin, daughter of Charles Craig, was an executive secretary at the Mystic Seaport. My aunt was a bookkeeper at the Mystic Shipyard. Extended family and close family friends worked as laborers at the Post Boatyard, now owned by Seaport Marine. My uncle slaked his thirst at John's Bar, now demolished for a parking lot. My house in Mystic has been continuously occupied by, by a family member for 61 years. We have roots and longevity. I know the authentic Mystic from 50 years ago before tourism got its grip. Downtown was Main Street, USA. Businesses were locally owned. There was no Mystic brand, which means it had not been corporatized. It was largely working class. Its downtown met all our daily needs and now meets none. Even my bank is gone. Who's smiling? Not me. This project is not going to profit or benefit me. Tourism and development mystic has made my quality of life go steadily down. A traffic nightmare already exists and my house is one of the most severely impacted. Route 1 runs along its side. In the summer, traffic backs up for, for the bridge once an hour from morning till evening right next to my house. They keep their motors idling, throw garbage in my yard, blast music. I can't keep my windows open on the north side or enjoy sitting on my porch. I wear earplugs in the house. It didn't used to be like this. Who is smiling? We have reached the tipping point. Unlike those in this tourism gold rush who claim this project is, is just the spark of an explosion to develop the shoreline, I call for a moratorium on big projects like Smiler's Wharf and a positive model of sustainable tourism that will preserve the original character of Mystic as a quaint, historic New England village where residents matter as much as tourists. Mystic is already overdeveloped. The woods continue to disappear at an alarming rate. This town is being corporatized and urbanized. Tall buildings, hardened riverfronts, bright lights, incessant traffic, redundant shopping, a fetishized drawbridge, heavy delivery trucks with, it is. I, I, I got cotton mouth. I need water. I'm almost finished, okay? A fetishized drawbridge, heavy delivery trucks with power brakes, and noise, especially noise from the custom motorcycle mufflers and hot rod engines that roar up Baptist Hill past my house. Baptist Hill has become a racetrack for those leaving town after idling on the Stonington side for the bridge. 
Who's smiling? Mystic is already overdeveloped. The planners, town organizers know it, constantly racking their brains for where to put more cars. And just look at the proliferation of signs down there in the heart of the village, the mother load of this gold rush. There are so many signs that you don't know which way to turn. This is tourism in overdrive. The frenzy is egregious. It's a gold rush. It's a mythical creation called Mystic Country, announced on a sign at the Amtrak station, but Mystic Country doesn't exist. It is as fictional as Shangri-La. If this is such a paradise, why do they want to pave it for more parking? Why do they want to destroy its character and threaten its environment? This development model is not sustainable. Tough act to follow. <laughs> My name is Spiros Barris. I've lived in Mystic for 35 years and on Washington Street for 15 years. I moved to Washington Street specifically because it is a quiet street with little traffic and a marina across the street from my house. I just want to share my personal experience with the traffic since everything else has pretty much been said, plus some. Um, the NDD regulations specifically state, as has been pointed out already but cannot be overemphasized, that a zone change to an NDD will, quote, enhance and not disrupt the surrounding residential neighborhood. The traffic issues alone will dramatically disrupt the neighborhood. Washington and Willow Street are commonly used by pedestrians, families with children walking to the park and playground, cyclists and runners wanting to avoid Route 1, residents of Apple Rehab and wheelchairs going to the park. All day long there are people running, riding, and walking up and down Washington and Willow Street. Because they are narrow and have no sidewalks, if there are two cars coming in opposing directions, either the pedestrians or one of the cars has to pull over to the side of the road to let the other pass. Two cars can barely pass each other in opposite directions, and with anything larger than a car, one vehicle has to pull over to let the other pass. How could the traffic that would be generated by a 45-room hotel, a 200-seat restaurant, 25 apartments, 22 res additional residential units and a community event space, including employee vehicles, delivery trucks, service vehicles, garbage trucks, etc., all passing through these narrow residential streets. How could all this additional traffic not disrupt the neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Adam Strelzik. I live on 44 Home Street. Uh, and I'm also gonna speak for a good friend of mine and colleague, uh, the Marikas, they're on 20 Jackson Ave. They were here a couple weeks ago, but uh, they can't make it now because they had to go back to Washington State. So they wrote here in, uh, that in 2004, they've owned their house uh, for about 30 years in their family. They bought it from their parents. Uh, it's, it is a three family. It's the one that you saw in some of the pictures with the three big porches. Um, they did write that uh, in 2014, they applied for several variances, one of which included a side porch expansion, which was denied based on the environmental impact to the wetlands area behind the property. <clears throat> this is the same wetland area which would be affected by the Smilers Wharf project. Uh, it would be very inconsistent for the town of Stonington to accept such a project, which will certainly have a significant environmental impact on what wetlands remain in downtown Mystic. Since Red 36 was opened, they wrote, a significant amount of new traffic has been observed both on Jackson Ave and Washington Street, often at speeds well above the local speed limit. In a residential area, the additional traffic not only will present severe congestion in an already congested downtown area, but also poses risks to families who used to enjoy a safe walkable area. As residents of Jackson Ave, we oppose this project based on the environmental impact to the area, the increased traffic in downtown Mystic, and the safety of children and families using this area. Okay, that's, that's for the 20 Jackson Street family. Uh, for me, uh, public access, really, I like it. I want to say thank you for thinking of that and, and not just privatizing the shoreline because we suffer from that around here. Uh, the economic benefit, that's all great, right? Big yachts, 
Sure, those are pretty awesome. I hope they drive my sons for, uh, for to have hunger for success when they see them. But uh, we need to support something like this. However, um, uh, I think as proposed, it's too tall, it's too many rooms or apartments, not enough boat yard. It really doesn't seem to be boat yard at all. And uh, is it 67 or 74 feet? I'm not really sure. We need to maintain our charm in this town. Uh, and this project does touch on a lot of that. Um, towns like Booth Bay, Maine, Telluride, Colorado, they've all spent a lot of time and effort trying to preserve their charm that they have in those communities. And uh, I think we fall a little short of that. So uh, we don't really need another Newport is kind of what my wife and I say at home. Uh, and uh, for big yachts, and we don't really take our families there, and there's a lot of reason for that. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm going by numbers. Yeah, they, we were on the list last time. Okay. So, and we have a Yeah, call. okay, go right ahead. Okay, so my name is Heidi Farrier, and I live at 42 Home Street, and I am the mother of two small children. Um, we have already fought to get a stop sign put on Home Street because the traffic there is out of control, and people also use that as a speedway to into and out of town. Um, so I am concerned, and I don't want to leave the traffic to the police. Well, the police will figure it out later. Um, I want that to be considered as part of the whole project. I do like the fact that some sort of development will some sort of development will need to go there. You can't just leave those buildings sitting at that um, parcel. Um, but I do worry because my kids use the playground, and I know there's a lot of talk about there not being a lot of you know, children households, but if you go to the playground, you will see nothing but children on their bikes and, you know, strollers and parents. And we don't take Home Street home. We go down Willow because it's safer. And every time my kids ride their bike on homes, my heart is in my throat that they're gonna tumble off into the street and get hit by a car because the people just don't obey the traffic and nobody's enforcing it like I wish that they would. Um, we are concerned about the sewage. Um, I would love to see more public boat access. That would be great. Um, however, like a year ago we were here for the rezoning and the purchasing of the boathouse property and it is sitting there with no public access and also, so there's no boating there even though that's what we bought it for. And the boat launch at Bay Street has been shut down. So there's other accesses that are available to us that we're we're not taking advantage of. Um, so those are some of the concerns. I would like to see something new go there, uh, but these are things that we would like to give more serious thought to. So thank you. Thank you. No, we're going to have. We're halfway through the opposition list, so we, it's eleven o'clock. So we'll do it, continue this at 7 o'clock on July 8th, right here. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, a point of order, please. Just, I want to bring to the Commission's attention, and I just would ask as a, as a matter of just procedure, that this is, if you're going to continue the hearing, it's an open public hearing, and therefore the applicant cannot have direct or indirect contact through the commission, unless it goes through your staff. And we had yeah. an issue that came up last Friday right. where we had a member of the public inappropriately contact members of the commission via email. And I, well, I, I announced that before. That right. I just want to make sure that it, it goes for the applicant, but also whether you're a proponent or a opponent, you can't talk to the commission yeah. between now and the Even end. though we'd like to talk to you, we can't talk to you until after this. Um, Thank you, Mr. I'm Chairman. Sorry about that. I need a motion to continue the hearing. It can be. No, I told him seven. Seven. All right, do I have a motion to continue the hearing? So moved. No, to continue. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. We have another zoning meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Mystic Middle School if anyone would like to come. Yes. 
And this issue will not be on the agenda of tomorrow's meeting. This will not, no.